The Index Astartes. Being a history of the Adeptus Astartes in all its many and various formations. The Imperial Fist's Third Company, the Sentinels of Terror. The Third Company, recorded in the Liber Honorius as the Sentinels of Terror, have a long and storied history. To recount the roster of its captains is to speak the names of heroes past, warriors whose deeds are known far across the galaxy. Helico, who held the gate of sanctity against the word-bearer host. Manhir, who scattered the orcs of Arcarus and levelled their fortress. And Demetrikos, the liberator of a hundred worlds in the Nebuchadnezzar sector. The company has a weighty reputation to maintain, but each generation of battle brothers does so with pride, seeking to honour their forebears, whilst forging legends of their own. For others, the Great Crusade ended long ago. For us, it will not cease until all the worlds of mankind are united once more, and the Emperor's Golden Age returns. Captain Darnath Lysander The Imperial Fists were the Emperor's Praetorians throughout the Great Crusade, a duty they discharged with honour on worlds beyond count. At the close of the 41st millennium, and the start of the 42nd, the Legion is long gone but the chapter that bears its name maintains the duties and traditions of old. At the end of the Great Scouring, the Imperial Fists observed what they saw as the rest of the Imperium giving up on the Emperor's dream of a united mankind, and swore that they would continue the fight, alone if necessary. Thus, the Great Crusade never finished for the Imperial Fists, whilst other Space Marine chapters and the Imperium at large have focused their efforts on preserving what remains. The Imperial Fists continue to campaign across the galaxy, prosecuting war against the enemies of mankind, and reclaiming worlds lost many thousands of years ago. Yet, though they are called to make war across the five segmentum of the galaxy, the Imperial Fists are the defenders of Terra still. Their fortress monastery, the vast warship known as Phalanx, holds station within the Sol system, and it is said the chapter maintains a sequence of coded alert signals that allow them to withdraw from other battle zones with astonishing speed should terror become threatened, just as they did once before. It is commonly held that the Imperial Fist's finest hour came during the siege of the Emperor's Palace, a fortress that their Primarch, Rogel Dorn, had been pivotal in creating. The truth, however, is that the Imperial Fists have many times been vital to the Imperium's survival. Though it is a point of honour amongst the Sons of Dawn that such things are spoken of, only out of need. Whilst the chapter has never been afflicted with the same clandestine secrecy that is endemic to the Dark Angels, for instance, neither do they approve of the braggatry uh, that permeates chapters such as the Space Wolves. As individuals and as a chapter, the Imperial Fists seek their purpose in the performance of great deeds, not the recounting of the same. As a result, those who encounter the Sons of Dawn are often left with the impression of sombre and cheerless warriors. Those that know them better, however, such as the Blood Angels, recognise the passion that all Imperial Fists keep under tight rein through adherence to protocol and pain gloves. This continual mortification is necessary for pride has ever been the Imperial Fist's greatest weakness. Pride is a powerful force for any man. It can spur a warrior on to great deeds, even whilst those around lose all hope. It dredges fresh strength from the most debilitating of fugues, and brings forth the flame of victory from the embers of despair. Yet pride is a sword that cuts both ways, as the chapter has too often found to its cost. Phalanx's Librarius contains many tales of Imperial Fists who have died needlessly, driven to fight on when their chapter and the Imperium both would have been better served by shamed but living warriors. Squads, companies, and if rumours speak truly, a yet greater tithe of the chapter's strength have perished in this manner at one time or another. Such losses would have destroyed any other chapter, but not the Imperial Fists, who maintain a recruit reserve far deeper than any other chapter, 
in order that whole companies can be reconstituted at incredible speed when needed. It is a note of pride to all who serve aboard Phalanx that so long as one battle brother yet stands to hold the chapter banner high, then the Sons of Dawn will never be truly defeated. In an attempt to counteract these character failings, the chaplains of the Imperial Fists preach credos, intending to instill a more measured approach to war. Any defeat can be reversed. The chapter's neophytes are taught, provided that there are warriors yet alive to see the matter done. Thus do the reclusium teach. But, at heart, they know those words are just balms to soothe the incurable. Stubbornness is as much a part of the Imperial Fists as their Primarch's gene seed, and it is a rare battle, brother, who can resist its lure forever. For an Imperial Fist, then, every battle is a test of will as much as anything else. Those who master their pride are able to embrace the strength it offers, but also have the wisdom to know when it tempts foolishness. Such space marines become heroes, but they can never truly escape the hubris of their blood. This certitude has been proven again and again in the long millennia of the chapter's existence, but nowhere does it shine so true as in the Crusade of Thunder, also known in the Imperial Fist Liber Honorius as the Third Company's Triumph. Lysander's Rise Lysander was marked for greatness from the very first, for he was recruited on holy terror itself. His presence at the Imperium's heart was the result of a long pilgrimage, started by his parents before his birth. It was a journey that took thirteen years to complete, and took the family through the devastation caused by Wa Grozdak, as well as the tumultuous horrors of the Quizark heresy. Lysander's parents perished along the way, murdered for refusing to recant their faith, but the boy survived. Living on his wits and the charity of the imperial cult, Lysander fought first to survive and then to complete his parents' pilgrimage. Gradually, the tale of the stoic pilgrim boy had grown almost to a legend, doubtless exaggerated by priests furthering their own goals. But by the time he finally arrived at Terra, Lysander was welcomed as a true hero of the faith. At that time, Chaplain Shadris of the Imperial Fists was on Terra. He had heard the tales of the pilgrim boy and found Lysander before the Pillar of Bone. This was known to many as a monument to the Imperial Fists' courage in the wake of a long-forgotten disaster. But Shadris knew its secret. The Pillar was the last remnant of the once great Imperial Fists' fortress monastery, destroyed in the Horus heresy. Shadris, too, was on a pilgrimage of sorts, to pay his respects to forebears long dead, and he took Lysander's presence as a weighty portent. When Shadris returned to Phalanx once again, he did so with the boy at his side. Lysander excelled on the harsh training fields of Juno and Ganymede, progressing through indoctrination and training with a speed seldom before witnessed. Under Shadris's tutelage, he learned that the Emperor was not a god, as the Imperial cult decreed, but a mighty warrior and visionary, from whose mortal flesh the space marines had sprung. Lysander rejected this at first, for faith had been the only sustenance he had known for much of his young life. However, he soon came to embrace this new truth, realising that it made the Emperor no less a saviour. Like all those who had come before him, Lysander pledged his life to upholding the Emperor's works, not as the helpless worshipper he had once been, but as a warrior, honouring the deeds of an illustrious forefather. Years passed, and Lysander passed into Captain Jostin's second company, the Swords of Terror, where he quickly rose to the rank of sergeant. Here, to the outrage of his peers, he cast out the official bolter drill honed over many thousands of years. Instead, Lysander trained his battle brothers in the more unorthodox techniques he had learned from Jonas Mackin the sombre scout sergeant who had inducted him into the art of war. When Jostin challenged Lysander about his breach of tradition, he refused to back down, arguing that effectiveness counted for more than blind adherence. However, in the end, it was only Shadris's intervention that prevented Lysander's demotion and censure. It would not be until later that year, during the Battle of Colonial Bridge on Aidano, that Lysander would at last know vindication. There, three tactical squads from the second company held the bridge, leading to the governor's palace 
against a cultist horde of some three thousand lost souls. Captain Jostin perished in the initial moments of the attack, a lucky autogun shell smashing through his helm's left eyepiece to bury itself deep in his brain. With Jostin's death, Lysander took control. Directing the survivors in the clockwork volleys first impressed upon him by Sergeant Macken. Unable to make headway through the storm of roaring shells, the cultists fell back in disarray, leaving a bloody rampart of their own dead behind. The Battle of Colonial Bridge was the first time that Lysander's name was recorded in the chapter's Liber Honoris. The same techniques that had once threatened to bring him ruin, now earning him great honour. The battle also granted Lysander a first glimpse of one of the treacherous Iron Warriors. It had been their heresies that had wrought insurrection on Aidano, and one of their augmented warriors was later discovered amongst the dead. The renegade's presence was enough to bring the full might of the Imperial Fist down on the planet, but no further traces of Perturabo's treacherous get were found. In the wake of the war, Lysander earned many more Imperial laurels. He became known as a warrior who would hold any position, no matter how indefensible it might appear to others. Yet he was no stranger to daring assaults either. Indeed, it was following the capture of the Eldar cruiser Blood of Cain that he rose to command of the Second Company. When the Imperial Fist deployed to break the three-year siege of Hadrak Tor, a planet in the merciless grasp of the Iron Warrior's warsmith, Shon Tu, it was Lysander who commanded the drop pod assault on the heights. Having secured the higher ground, Lysander's strike force set up teleport homers to summon the terminators of the first company into the thick of the fighting. Alas, the defenders had set a tremor in the warp, and many of the terminators materialized over deep chasms or else in solid rock. Clytus, captain of the first company, was one of these, his body reforming around solid stone. Before he died, Clytus thrust his thunder hammer the Fist of Dawn, into Lysander's hands, and bade him seek vengeance through victory. This Lysander did, leading the survivors of the First Company alongside his own to shatter the Iron Warrior's stronghold. Shantu fled from the planet in defeat, but he had left a mystery in his wake. Survivors spoke of how the Warsmith had concerned himself little with the despoiling of their world, and had instead buried himself in searches of the millennia-old archives. Unfortunately, there was no way to know what Sean Tu had been searching for, as he had destroyed the archives before making his escape. In the reorganization that followed Hadrak Tor, Lysander was elevated to the rank of First Captain, Master of the First Company, Overseer of the Armory, and Watch Commander of Phalanx. Chaplain Shadris, now centuries old, looked upon the path his recruit had walked and saw his faith had been rewarded. Lysander seemed certain to rise one day to the supreme rank of chapter master, and perhaps lead the Imperial Fists into a new and glorious age. Alas, this glorious destiny was not to be. As the 40th millennium came to a close, the strike cruiser Shield of Valor was lost in the war. All hands, Lysander amongst them, were lost alongside, with slender hope for their return. For a time, the Imperial Fists nurtured the hope that the Warp would give up their battle brothers, living or dead. In time, however, they had to accept the loss. Lysander's statue was raised in the Hall of Heroes. Yet Lysander and his crew were not so dead as many supposed. Cast far off course by the whimsy of the Warp, they were flung forward through the centuries and far across the galaxy. When the Shield of Valor finally emerged into real space, it did so in the fading years of the 41st millennium, and in the orbit of Maladrax, an iron warrior's fortress on the Eye of Terror's fringe. Swiftly disabled by the world's formidable defences, the strike cruiser was boarded, and a handful of survivors, Lysander amongst them, taken as prisoners. Lysander's captor, the warsmith Shon Tu, believed himself the reincarnation of the legendary Dark Age warlord, who had borne the same name. He had christened Maladrax after his predecessor's mythical fortress, and, as he went about his bloody tortures, Shantou recounted his glorious past deeds, ever boasting of the horrific legends he would reforge. He spoke endlessly of the Spear Hydros, bringer of the swarm, and his search to reclaim 
the Leviathan Warbark Etamanesh, whose weapons had laid waste to a thousand worlds, and Shantu boasted would do so again. Such was Lysander's force of will that he endured where few others could have done so. Though burdened by grievous harms, the captain tore free of his bondage scant weeks after his capture. Bereft of arms and armour, he wrought a storm of destruction on Malodrax's capital, seized control of a shuttle, and escaped with two of his battle brothers. When at last, Lysander returned to Phalanx, although I don't know how he could have possibly done that considering he was in a shuttle, the ranks of his chapter were torn. Most rejoiced to see that a hero of the past had been returned to them, but a few were riven with doubt, for fear that Lysander's experiences had not left him without taint. In the months that followed, every fragment of Lysander's body and mind was subjected to the most exhaustive of investigations. Yet, no matter how deep the apothecaries, librarians, and chaplains delved, no trace of corruption could be found. At the last, Lysander was restored to command of the First Company, an appointment met with almost as much celebration as his return. Before a year had passed, Lysander returned to the unceasing war that had defined his life. His first target was Maladrax itself, where he repaid a thousandfold the indignities forced upon him in its dungeons. Though Shantou escaped that maelstrom of blood and fire, he did so weakened and beaten. Yet Malodrax was but the start. Lysander's vengeance had only just begun. Storm clouds gather. Vladimir Pew, master of the Imperial Fists, is a meticulous planner as any chapter master in the Imperial Fist history should be. In addition, he is a fine judge of his battle brothers, and it is said that he can learn more from a single appraising glance than an extensive psychic probe will ever uncover. This peerless judgment has many times ensured the promotion of a strike force commander has been granted to the ideal individual, leaving Pew free to concentrate on the chapter's overall strategy. Like all Imperial Fists, Vladimir Pew cleaves tight to tradition, to the teachings of Rogel Dawn and the wisdom of the Codex Astartes. He was once offered a seat upon the Council of the High Lords, perhaps the greatest honour any servant of the Imperium could ever earn while still drawing breath. However, Pew did not believe himself worthy of such an honour and unhesitatingly refused the position on precisely those grounds. Pew's faith in his chapter is absolutely reciprocated by those who serve beneath him. Even the lowliest of recruits knows that the stern patriarch's actions are completely divorced from personal pride and wholly in the interests of the Imperium. They also know that Pew feels each of his chapter's losses keenly, and they thus draw resolve from the knowledge that those of their number that die do so with a purpose. However, only a few know that some of the chapter master's many scars are not wounds earned in battle, but bodily mortifications inflicted by Pew's own hand, each one carved in memory of a battle brother lost under his command. Following the scourging of Maladrax, Lysander threw himself into the extermination of the Iron Warriors. Within three years, the captain had masterminded and led the destruction of three other fortress worlds bordering the Eye of Terror, one of which, the Black Star Redoubt, had ground three separate Cadian assaults into bloody paste across the previous decade. In his works, Lysander had the ferocious approval of his chapter master and a tacit devotion from the rest of his battle brothers which bordered upon worship. Pew was, if anything, slightly weary of Lysander, for he feared that the other might attempt to leverage his reputation in an effort to become the next chapter master. In another man, Pew's concerns might have been the result of ego or pettiness, but such things were entirely alien to his nature. An honest and honourable warrior, even by the exacting standards of the Imperial Fists, Pew would have readily stood aside for a worthy candidate. However, the chapter master could not quite allay his concerns about Lysander, with whom he had clashed on several occasions since his return. Pew found his first captain a little too stubborn, a little too swift to recount the ways in which his experience exceeded that of his chapter master. Even discounting Lysander's lost millennium in the warp, 
He had nearly a century of experience over any living imperial fist. Pew did not wish to fight Lysander's ascension, which he saw as inevitable. He merely wished to delay that day until Lysander was truly ready for the chapter's gilded throne. Pew had always felt that his own ascension had come too early, that the deaths of 170 imperial fists in the Boreal planet strike could have been avoided, but for his own stubborn refusal to fall back. Pew had learned from that disaster, but considered the price of that wisdom too steep. For his part, Lysander was still coming to terms with life in a new millennium. Much was the same, for bureaucratic inertia and tradition had made it so, but almost every warrior he had known from before was now dead. Most had perished on the Emperor's battlefields, bringing his vengeance to the enemies of mankind, and Chaplain Shadris had passed on during the Siege of Moros, at last having found a foe canny enough to take his life. Joran Mackin, Lysander's scout sergeant during his formative years, was now interred within a dreadnought's adamantium sarcophagus, but his mind was so scattered that he no longer recognised his old student. Such was Lysander's unrelenting ferocity in his pursuit of the Iron Warriors that the Imperial Fists often entered battle bereft of their first company, which was all too often hammering yet another renegade fortress to dust many light years distant. Other chapters, indeed other chapter masters than Vladimir Pew, might have sought to quell so personal a crusade lest it overtake a space marine's broader and selfless duties. However, the ten thousand year hatred between the Iron Warriors and the Imperial Fists was a powerful force, and Pew found it fitting that a part of the chapter's strength was ever dedicated to repaying the slights of the Iron Cage and ten thousand other battles. In any event, Pew could think of no better way to test Lysander's suitability for a more exalted rank than commanding such missions. The first company did not always fight alone, as Lysander's plans grew ever more ambitious. Pew assigned additional forces to his temporary command. At the Rivald Maze, Lysander's strike force consisted not only of the first company, but also demi-companies from the second and fifth. At the Black Star Redoubt, Pew himself accompanied the third and ninth companies, content to serve as Lysander's strategic observer, the better to take full measure of his first captain's abilities. Nevertheless, and despite his intended detachment, Pew found himself fighting at Lysander's side in the final assault on the weapon forges. He saw the Fist of Dawn shatter the vast black gates, and cheered as loud as any of his battle brothers as Lysander smote the towering demon prince who served as master of the forge. A day later, when Pew watched from orbit as barrage bombs collapsed the Black Star Redoubt's jagged iron spires, he knew that the time had come. Upon the return to Phalanx, Pew would step down and take a captaincy. The future of the Imperial Fists would lie in Lysander's hands. Then came the attack on Taladorn. The Iron Warriors had not sat idly by whilst Lysander had levelled their holdings. An influential new warlord had risen to power amongst Perturabo's sons. With promises of revenge and dark glory, he raised a new army, the Sons of the Forge, from the remnants of warbands crushed by Lysander's hammer blows. No one but this warlord knew why the manufacturing world of Taladorn was chosen, save perhaps as an object lesson in needless malice. There was certainly no military goal beyond the stark application of terror, a reassertion of the Iron Warrior's might following a string of defeats. The fleet of gunmetal battleships struck Taladorn without warning, pounding the world's defences into rubble before unleashing wave after wave of dreadclaws upon the planet's surface. Dropships in the shape of tentacled dragons followed, their coiled feelers flailing as they sought purchase among the Manufactorum's upper towers. As the vessel settled into position, warpsmiths struck runes of containment from the passenger bays, and snarling demon engines spilled into the city streets. The defence commanders mustered what forces they could, but troops recruited to confront the violence of gangs, smugglers and pirates were of little use against the monstrosities that now tore their regiments to red ruin. Valkyries, operating from a hidden airbase on the polar continent, screamed south to engage a second wave of renegade dropships, were swatted from the sky by the Heldrakes that 
swooped and dove upon Taladorn's volcanic thermals. Taladorn Primus, seat of the planetary governor, surrendered after less than a day's fighting. Before the week was out, almost all the other cities had petitioned for mercy. Only Taladorn Decimus, located in the extreme south, still stood unconquered. Built as it was into the side of an obsidian mountain, its defences had ridden out the bombardment better than those of its fellows. Any dreadclaw that landed within range of Decimus's guns was blown apart by shellfire, and any dropship or helldrake that entered its skies risked obliteration by its impressive array of defence lasers. Yet, stalwart as it was, Decimus could not offer assistance to its fellows. Thus did its inhabitants watch helplessly as the Iron Warriors set about enslaving the population, praying all the while that the storm of iron would leave them untouched. In the following weeks, the Iron Warriors wrought great change upon the planet. Taladorn Primus was overrun by coiling mecha roots, woven together to form a vast dome structure over the ruins. This had become the Forge Heart, an imposing citadel beneath which the Iron Warriors grafted bond slaves, men and women, who had embraced damnation for promises of mechanical apotheosis, fed the bellowing demon forges night and day. The previous inhabitants, those who still lived, now toiled beneath Taladon Sextus. This blasted ruin was now little more than a forced labour mining complex, squatting amongst the rubble and supplying precious ores to the rapacious warp foundries beneath the forge heart. By the time the Imperium responded, millions had perished in the mines, and the Mecha roots had spread to cover almost the entire southern continent. Taladorn was well on its way to becoming a new fortress world. The planet had been under occupation for a little over two months when the Space Marines at last arrived. This was not a coordinated counter-strike, but a piecemeal response to Taladorn's garbled distress calls. Thus, when the Imperial Fists arrived, they found the world's orbit lit with lance flares and torpedo trails, and an impressive fleet of crimson Ascalon-class frigates engaging the Iron Warrior's fleet. The Blood Angels' vessels attacked with their customary bravado, ignoring the disparity in size and numbers. Already one of the Chaos battleships was afire along its length, puffs of atmosphere venting as escape pods hurtled out into the void. As Lysander watched from the bridge of the battle barge, Storm of Wrath, a cluster of boarding torpedoes struck home against the aft section of a second Iron Warrior's ship, and the first captain knew them to contain Blood Angel's boarding parties, a brave but reckless strategy. Deeming that the momentum of the Blood Angel's assault would soon dwindle, Lysander ordered the Storm of Wrath and its support fleet to join the battle. The Iron Warrior's admiral was quick to respond. Like Lysander, he knew that the Storm of Wrath was the single mightiest vessel so far engaged. Its survival or destruction would determine where victory lay. At an unseen command, three chaos-heavy cruisers came about on an interception heading, swarms of hell dregs boiling out of their fighter bays. Ignoring the Blood Angels' frigates, they bore down on the Storm of Wrath with violent determination. As the Storm of Wrath's guns fired their first salvo, another force entered the growing battle as the ultramarine strike cruiser Valen's Revenge burst into real space off the battle barge's port flank. The newcomer fired its prow guns in brief salute, then drove in hard beneath the storm of wrath, its dorsal weapons batteries roaring as they obliterated a vanguard wave of helldrakes. The prudent action for Lysander to have taken at that point would have been to obliterate or repel the Chaos Fleet before initiating planet strike. However, he quickly decided otherwise. When later recounting the battle to the chapter council, Lysander would cite his concern that every moment of delay was another moment in which the Forge Heart's defence systems could have been brought online. But the truth of the matter was that he had little patience for duelling amongst the stars, while the Iron Warrior's grip lay tight about an imperial world. Ordering the Storm of Wrath into a slow belly roll to bring its deployment chutes into alignment, Lysander left command of the battle barge with its commodore and ordered his assault force to their drop pods. As the heavy cruisers reached weapons range and the battle barge's hull began to shudder under shell impacts, the Imperial Fists launched their assault on Taladorn. The first wave of the Imperial Fists' planet strike came as a storm of barrage bombs and land strikes. 
They slammed into the forechart like bolts of divine fury, collapsing sections of the dome to crush the smokestacks and the demon forges below. Mecha roots flailed like wounded animals, the ends thrashing madly through the bombardment's dust clouds. A few defense batteries returned sporadic fire, but a second bombardment followed hard on the heels of the first, silencing these emplacements. Scores of iron warriors and many hundreds of their bond slaves perished in those opening salvos, blown apart by shockwaves or crushed flat by falling rubble. The planetary assault began in earnest even as the shockwaves ceased. Lysander had given the honour of vanguard to Vaughan Hagen's 5th Company, and they struck with a precision worthy of dawn. Drop pods screamed downwards, their retro thrusters pinpricks of brilliant white light against an angry red sky. They tore through weakened sections in the forge hard's dome, slamming into the rubble-strewn expanse below. Drop pod hatches slammed down as one, and the Battle Brothers of the 5th Company strode out into the debris-choked air, bolters blazing as they came. An instant later, the air flickered as Captain Lysander and three squads of the 1st Company's Terminators teleported into position. Lysander had ordered the rest of the 1st Company, under the command of Honoured Sergeant Julian, to capture the slave pens beneath Taladorn Sextus. Lysander was aware that splitting his already outnumbered force was something of a risk, but had few doubts about Julian's ability, and none at all about his own. The counterattack began almost immediately. Bolt and auto shells streamed from amongst the rubble, every weapon aimed by a hated iron warrior or a zealous bond slave hoping to earn his master's favour. Still, the Imperial Fist came on. Under Lysander's terse commands, they advanced across the shattered tangle of permacrete and adamantium, disdaining all thought of cover. Heavy weapons fire split the air, las cannons and plasma guns, crude from the balconies of smoke-blackened spires and gantry lines spitting bright death. Devastators return fire, missiles and heavy bolter shells, hammering at the defenders' positions. A vast stone balcony, all but disintegrated under the impact of two crack missiles, and screaming cultists plunged to their depths amidst the rubble below. Their bodies trampled beneath the advancing imperial fists. All at once, the defenders' fire slackened as the bond slaves retreated into the tangle of corridors, leaving their masters to fend for themselves. Not so much as a single iron warrior took a step backward. Planting their feet firmly amongst the wreckage, the traitors taunted their ancient enemies, daring them to come forward and die. The Imperial Fist's response came as another volley of bolt gun fire, the roar of the guns drowning out their foes' raucous taunts. Captain Vogan's third company did not deploy for another quarter of an hour, their launch delayed by a concerted bombing run on the Storm of Wrath. By the time their drop pods smashed home amongst the dead and dying, the battle had moved on. Com traffic told Vogan that Lysander had moved up into the fortress's command spire and half of the 5th Company had gone with him. The rest, under Hagen's command, had spread out to secure the fortress's depths. Baltifier still raged in the middle distance. The battle was far from over. The further into the forge heart the 3rd Company drove, the more twisted the environs became. Gone were the stark lines of an imperial manufactorum. Instead, Macro roots pulsed and writhed around pillars fused from metal and flesh. Not all of Taladorn's inhabitants had survived to reach the mines. Many, infected by some machine contagion, had become the materials from which the forge heart had been fashioned. Their contorted faces stared out from walls, mouths open in silent screams at their horrifying fate. Veteran Sergeant Garadon, Vogan's second in command, and the company's most decorated warrior, broke his customary silence as he looked upon these tortured dead and swore to avenge them. Tor Garadon is a well-known and heroic figure within the Imperial Fists. He is a third company sergeant. Tor Garadon was recruited to the Imperial Fists from the orbitals of Callisto. His wealthy family were only too glad to see him depart. Fate had cursed the young Garadon with a straightforward and stubborn nature, ill-matched to the glittering societal circles his kin frequented. During his first decade of service, Garadon earned commendation after commendation. Despite his deeds, Garadon never sought promotion, nor was it ever offered to him. 
yet Garadon's silence concealed a sharp mind, if one little given to revealing itself, except when absolutely necessary. The first time this truly came to the fore was during a Nosfar planet strike, when the Third Company was stranded behind the Necron Forces lines. Chapter Command had no contact with the Third Company for nearly two Nosferan weeks, until sixty battered battle brothers appeared out of the sulphur mists and provided vital support in the battle against Magistar Zangenep's keneptic hosts. Brother Garadon submitted only the tersest of reports, but other survivors spoke of how he had taken command upon Captain Opera's death. When Captain Julius Vogan took command of the Third Company, he judged there to be more to Garadon than others had allowed themselves to see, he took it upon himself to unlock the potential of his junior battle brother. By the time Garadon had earned a position in the hallowed First Company, he and Vogon shared an unbreakable friendship, one which would later see the younger Space Marine return to the Sentinels of Terror without hesitation to serve as a veteran sergeant. Now to return to the battle. Under Vogon's command, the newcomers pushed on into the hellish maze of smelting pits and blazing forges. Lysander's trail of destruction was easily found, but following it was another matter. More iron warriors were converging on the battle, drawn to Lysander's presence as moths to a vengeful flame. They found the third company instead, and a vicious running battle broke out amongst the smelting pits. Some of the gantry lines and scaffolds were unstable, and many combatants' battles ended not in glorious volleys of bultifar, but in seething pits of molten metal. As the battle raged, a quadrupedal demon engine charged out of the darkness. It leapt high onto a permacrete wall, then pounced down into Tactical Squad Renon. Five battle brothers went down as the Mauler fiend struck, the survivors hauled away by the beast's flailing tentacles. The demon engine was in motion again even before its victims had hit the ground, pistons driving it on towards Vogan. The captain had but a moment before the creature was on him. It was not enough. Even as Vogan's crackling power fist came round, the Mauler fiend slammed into him. The beast's colossal mass bore the captain to the ground, and Vogan's gauntlet slammed into the side of its armoured skull. The blow smashed one of the monster's glittering eyes, leaving a livid scar of ruined metal in its place. The beast barely slowed. With a hiss of pistons, it punched a massive alloy fist down onto the captain's breastplate, shattering his power armour and pulping the space marine's chest. Vogan died instantly. Tearing his attention from the traitor marines, Sergeant Garadon barked orders into his comlink. Laz cannons blazed, boring deep into the beast's warp metal torso. The Mauler fiend roared in pain and gathered itself for another pounce, but the Laz cannons flared for a second time, their devastating energies striking with precision and shearing off one of the demon engine's forelegs. With a last terrible roar, the Mauler fiend slumped to its side, oily blood spilling from its wounds. With the demon engine's defeat, the Iron Warrior's determination faded. In ones and twos, they broke off into the darkened corridors, detailing the remains of Squad Renon to carry Captain Vogan's remains back to the drop zone. Garadon assumed command and redoubled the company's pace. At last, after what seemed an age, the Third Company emerged onto the pinnacle of the command spire, or what was left of it. What had once been the planetary governor's palace was now overcome and by the coiling corruption of the Iron Warrior's Tecna Arcana. Scattered throughout the alcoves, windows and gateways were vast, coiling, crusted, hexagonal pods. At the apex of each, cables pulsed as they delivered vile fluids to whatever lay within. But it was the battle raging at the chamber's heart that drew Garadon's attention. There, amongst the carbon-scored tangle of ruined machinery, some thirty warriors of the Fifth Company fought alongside the bulkier Terminator armoured veterans of the First. Gun metal clad dead were piled deep around them, but there was golden armour too amongst the grey. To Garadon's eye, too many battle brothers had fallen, and more would perish before this battle was done. The Imperial fists were severely outnumbered, and the air was full of metallic roars of demon engines. In the centre of the chamber, Lysander clashed with a hulking figure clad in what had once been Terminator armour. Now both flesh and armour were merged, a horrifying melding of man and machine. This was the warlord of the Sons of the Forge, come at last to face his domain's invaders. Garadon didn't hesitate. 
With a single barked word of command, he threw the third company into the fray. Lysander saw none of it, for he was lost to the battle with his hated foe. This was no mere warlord he faced, but Shontu, ruler of vile Maladrax. The Fist of Dawn swung about, shattering Shontu's left shoulder guard, but still the warlord came on and leered upon his face in a demon sword grasped tight in his left hand. Knocking Lysander's second blow aside, Shontu slammed his unwounded shoulder into Lysander's chest. As the first captain staggered backwards, Sean too pressed the fingers of his free hand tight upon his left gauntlet. Responding to this silent signal, the pods lined upon the walls cracked open with a leer of greenish gas, and the feeder cables tore free. Metallic roars echoed across the command spire, their timbre somewhere between rage and agony, and scores of glistening demon engines launched forth into the battle. As Lysander threw himself at Shontu once again, his comlink crackled into life. The blockade fleet had been driven off, the ultramarines had made orbit, and Captain Sicarius now offered reinforcement. Lysander was incensed. This was the Imperial Fist's battle. Honor decreed that they would claim victory from this adversary as they had many before. Hagen's forces would soon return from the depths to join the battle, and Perturabo's cursed sons would be annihilated. Catching the strike of Sean II's demon sword high upon his shield, the first captain angrily refused the Ultramarine's assistance and fought on. Elsewhere, the newly birthed demon engines had seemed disorientated at first, and this gave Sergeant Garadon some much-needed time to react. The third company was still some distance from linking up with their beleaguered battle brothers, so Garadon ordered his warriors to form a defensive ring in the heart of the nearest courtyard. From this living fortress, his devastators could track and destroy the onrushing demon engines. At least, that was the plan. As his battle brothers took their positions, Garadon saw that these monstrosities were not quite the same as the creatures that had slain Vogan. They were incomplete somehow, trailing metal tubing and viscous fluids. Some had stubby, half-formed weaponry. Others had warped and mottled armor, the texture akin to molten wax. They were unfinished, Garadon realized. Sean too must have been desperate indeed, but half-forged or no, the newly woken demon engines quickly proved themselves fearsome foes. A roar of engines from the skies above at last denoted the arrival of a flight of Imperial Fist storm ravens, the heavy rasping of their assault cannons a welcome sound amidst the carnage. The heavy shells tore into the Iron Warriors, driving them back from where the Fifth Company, who had accompanied Lysander, stood their ground but they made little impact on the demon engine's armoured hides. With a screech, a helldrake plunged from the bleak skies, its talons tearing deep into one of the storm ravens. Crippled, the flyer plunged groundward, its impact tearing a bloody furrow through the third company's position. As more helldrakes arrived from the skies, the surviving storm ravens banked away to begin their own fight for survival. Nevertheless, between their intervention and the fortitude of the first company's terminators, the fifth would endure. The same could not be said for those who had fought to rescue them. Its formation shattered by the Storm Raven's impact, the third company was being mauled. Fire rained down from all sides, and two dozen battle brothers had already fallen. The survivors fought on, teeth gritted against the pain of their wounds, but their foes were too many. A forge fiend's autocannons blazed, and three battle brothers of Squad Tynon were torn apart. Brother Conraf, the lone dreadnought assigned to the third company, turned his multi-melter on the monstrosity and reduced it to steaming slag. But his armor soon buckled as other demon engines returned fire. Roiling gouts of warp energy tore through the third company's position, the blistering clouds melting armor and incinerating flesh. Sergeant Garadon, his right arm shattered by an autocannon shell, saw his brothers dying about him and roared defiance. Again, Lysander's comlink crackled into life with an offer of assistance, but again he refused. Hagen, as yet unaware of the situation atop the spire, made no response, but Garadon looked around at the ruin of his battle brothers and came to a decision. Triggering his own comm, he made formal acceptance of Sicarius's offer. Lysander's bellow of rage flooded the channel and drowned out the Ultramarine's response. Garadon paid it no heed and triggered his teleport homer. A moment later, there was a flicker of motion as some thirty Ultramarines Terminators materialised in the chamber, 
Storm bolters and assault cannons already bellowing their anthem of war. This new arrival marked the last turning point in the Battle of Taladorn. Shon Tu had no surprises remaining to him, and following Garadon's request for assistance, the forces marshalled against the warsmith rose steeply, next to arrive with the Ultramarine's second company, the Thunderhawks Gladius and Spartha, descending from the skies amidst a whine of turbo-laser fire. Hard on their heels, deploying from Storm Raven gunships at breakneck speed with the vanguard of Captain Tycho's Blood Angels. Where before the Space Marines had been outnumbered, now they had the upper hand. The Ultramarines advanced methodically through the rubble, their line of battle expanding and contracting to match the Iron Warriors' desperate counterattacks. One of Shantou's lieutenants, a giant of a man named Marax, took refuge in the remains of the Divinitatus Shrine. The brute directed his followers' fire with such ruthless efficiency that any ultramarine who approached was all but torn apart. This ended when Tycho loosed his death company against the ruins. Seemingly impervious to pain, the black-armoured warriors forged on through the storm of fire, hacking at the defenders with chainswords or tearing them apart with bare hands. Overwhelmed by their fury, Marax's makeshift bastion collapsed. The survivors left to the ultramarine's guns. By the time Captain Hagen's demi company had reached the command spire, the force upon which Lysander had pinned his hopes of victory, the Iron Warriors were in full retreat. Shantu, seeing his cause lost, fled with his followers and escaped into the tunnels below. It would take many more days to fully drive the Iron Warriors from Taladorn and to scour their works from the planet's surface, but no effort was spared until the task was complete. Dozens of traitors and many hundreds of bond slaves were hunted down and slain, but of Shantu, no trace could be found. Lysander said little in that time, and spoke not at all to Sicarius or Tycho, instead leaving Sergeant Julian to liaise with what he still saw as unwelcome allies. Once Sean too had fled beyond his reach, Lysander had at last awoken from his vengeful fever, and was forced to confront the cost of his obsession. And it was a high cost. Over ninety of his battle brothers had been slain, including Captain Vogan, had Lysander waited to make a coordinated assault with the Ultramarines or Blood Angels, many of those deaths could have been avoided. Worse, had the Ultramarines not intervened, the tally of honoured dead would have been much higher. As for Garadon, he and the Third Company played little part in the closing phases of the Taladorn campaign. The apothecaries deemed scarcely a dozen battle brothers of the Sentinels of Terror fit to fight, and the sergeant was not amongst them. Thus, as the Fifth Company aided the Ultramarines and Blood Angels in scouring Taladorn, Garadon endured a frustrating period of convalescence. The inactivity gave him much time to think on the Third Company's fate, and by the time the Storm of Wrath was en route to Phalanx, Garadon was determined that Lysander's prideful folly would be brought to account. The Storm Breaks The return of Lysander's strike force to Phalanx should have been a time for sober celebration, but such was not to be. Shortly after the Storm of Wrath had taken formation with the rest of the Imperial Fist's fleet, Sergeant Garadon had requested a private audience with Vladimir Pew, and therein laid bare the story of the Third Company's near demise. Such a meeting was not altogether unusual amongst the Imperial Fists, for the warriors of that chapter have ever held one another to the highest standards of deportment and discipline. Nevertheless, this was not a step that Garadon took lightly, for a sergeant to seek censure of a captain was unusual enough, to demand it of an honoured hero like Lysander, there would be no good outcome from such a challenge. It said much of Garadon's unease at the situation that he had three times sought Lysander out during the homeward voyage. He had hoped to see some element of contrition from the captain, some sign that the follies of Taladorn would not occur again. On each occasion, Garadon was angrily dismissed, with Lysander threatening to strip the sergeant of his rank if he persisted. Garadon was perceptive enough to recognise that he was not the true target of the captain's anger, but wise enough to realise that matters had progressed beyond his ability to rectify. Pew was greatly displeased. His ire stemmed not from the sergeant's candour. Indeed, he commended Garadon for speaking on the matter, nor was the rendition of the Battle of Taradon entirely new to him. Lysander had already given his own account of the engagement, a report that had been scrupulously honest in every detail, from his audacious planet strike through to his repeated refusals of assistance. No, what concerned Pew was the fact that Lysander showed no sign of remorse at the outcome 
his decisions had led to. The first captain cared only that the Iron Warriors had been defeated and the world returned to the Imperial fold. Pew found this attitude dangerous. There had been triumph at Taladorn, true enough, but brought with such needless sacrifice that another dozen such victories would see the glorious traditions of the Imperial Fists ended altogether. Too often had the blood of Dawn guided his children down such a path. The invaders, to name but one of the Imperial Fists' successors, ever risked annihilation because of their stubborn refusal to back away from the unwinnable. Moreover, Pew knew that many of the Imperial Fists' captains looked to Lysander, for example, rather than to himself, which could become problematic if the first captain's deeds went unchallenged. After several days of silent meditation and with heavy hearts, Pew convened the chapter council to judge Lysander's conduct. Thus did the eight other surviving captains of the Imperial Fists convene in the shadow-shrouded cloister of remembrance to determine if pride, rather than duty, had come to rule Lysander's actions. This was an old tradition, the captains affirming their obligations beneath the gazes of the honoured dead. Golden statues, each many times the height of a man, stood silent in the tiered alcoves that lay around the chamber's circular perimeter, the flickering of lumen in each alcove seeming to make expressions play upon the statues' faces. Some alcoves were empty, awaiting a battle brother to prove himself worthy of such remembrance. It had been a thousand years since the last statue was raised, and a millennium could march by before the honour was again bestowed. There were no furnishings in the cloister of remembrance, no seats upon which the captains could rest, and no council table to pound in support or detraction of a particular course. Each captain took his place at the room's perimeter, whilst Pew, as head of the council, stood in the centre, pacing to address each of his brothers as need arose. Pew had ordered Garadon's presence, and the sergeant now stood in the space set aside for the third company's captain. He was soon called upon as witness to Lysander's part in his company's near demise. Garadon addressed the assembly calmly, for his anger had cooled within the passing weeks. Captain Hagen, commander of the fifth company, was another matter. He had dwelt greatly on events, and come to realise that his own company, though scarred during the Taladorn planet strike, could easily have suffered in the third stead. Anger bubbled beneath his otherwise clinical account. Hagen gave projections of what would have happened had Lysander not divided the strike force's companies, and if he had not begun the planet strike until the Ultramarines and Blood Angels could have provided support. Yet it was Lysander's own testimony that was the most damning in Pew's eyes, albeit unintentionally. The first captain spoke of the Imperial Fist's tradition of sacrifice, of their duty to crush the works of traitors wherever they took root. There could not be, he maintained, too high a price to pay in pursuit of this cause. The Iron Warriors were the Imperial Fist's burden to bear, and their honour to defeat. Without looking at Garadon, Lysander scorned the idea that assistance had ever been required, and moreover suggested that the Ultramarine's arrival had in fact created the distraction which had allowed Warsmith Shantou's escape. As Lysander spoke, Pew marked the approving expressions and nods of affirmation given by fully half of the captains present. As a mere acting captain, Garadon had no vote upon the council. Lysander's words and demeanour had spoken to the Imperial Fist's selfless and self-reliant traditions, and those captains with whom such things resonated strongest were inclined to overlook where that path had led them. Pew had hoped to salvage some unity from Taladorn by demoting Lysander, making him an example of pride gone awry, the lesson of generations to come. The chapter master was certain that the first captain would have recovered from such a blow and would have even emerged the stronger for it. Such a thing was impossible now, for with the chapter council so evenly divided, an obvious rebuke would create division. On the other hand, to not act would drive a wedge between Lysander and those captains who disapproved of his actions at Taladorn. As chapter master, Pew did not need the consent of his captains to take decisions, but he had long ago learned that leadership was more effective when wielded subtly. Dawn, for all his forthrightness, had understood that concept, and now Pew 
resolved to emulate his forefather. Rather than put the matter to a vote, Pew decreed that Lysander would set aside his duties as first captain for a time and take Vogan's place as commander of the battered third company. There was rebuke in that course of action, for it was an obvious demotion. However, Pew pointed out that there was honour as well, and reminded all present that he could think of no one better placed to rebuild the shattered company from its current lamentable state. Lysander's skill as a drill master had not faded since his days as a sergeant, and there would be much work for him in the rebuilt third. It was one thing to draft replacements from the reserve companies to replenish the third's losses. It was another thing entirely to expect those warriors to act as a single unit from the very start. Pew, furthermore, ordered that Sergeant Julian would assume command of the first company until such time as Lysander's task was complete. The wall noted that the chapter master set no time scale under which he expected this to be achieved. The Garadon frowned at his chapter master's words but said nothing. He had hoped that his temporary command of the third would become permanent, but it was incensed that it would pass to the very man responsible for its near destruction. Even Garadon's status as sergeant was now in doubt, for he recalled all too well that his last conversation with his new captain had ended with the threat of sanction. For his part, Lysander was careful to maintain an even tone as he accepted his chapter master's judgment. Moreover, he thanked Pew for the opportunity to forge the third company in battle against the Iron Warriors, as he himself had been forged. Sean too, Lysander insisted, would at last be brought to account for his crimes. Lysander's expression stiffened noticeably when Pew informed him that the third company would not be assigned to pursue the Iron Warriors. Rather, they would prosecute a new campaign, a crusade of thunder against the orcs of the Magor Rift, whose threat had been growing for several years. Against these foes, the third company would hone their skills and prove themselves worthy of the traditions they bore. Lysander looked around the cloister for support, but found none. Without a word, he strode from the room and into his new future as captain of the third company. The crusade begins. With Vladimir Pugh's edict, momentum for the crusade of thunder began to grow. However, Lysander's command as yet consisted only of some thirty warriors and the battle barge Storm of Wrath. It was the foundation of a mighty force, but little more. The third's losses would have to be replenished before the campaign could truly begin. Seven sergeants had been lost on Taladorn, and, for the most part, replacements were chosen from those battles who had survived the battle. Sergeant Garadon was surprised when Lysander consulted him about which of the third company's warriors were most suitable for promotion. As with most, every word that passed between the two at that time, the conversations were stilted and awkward, with both men making a poor show of hiding their mutual dislike. Nevertheless, Garadon experienced the first sparks of a grudging respect for his new captain, if only for the professionalism with which he took to his new duties. This grew further when Lysander confirmed that he was content for Garadon to remain in position as squad primacy's sergeant, and even offered a grudging apology for the previously threatened demotion. Garadon took both of these things with much the same ill grace as they were offered. In the end, several of the vacant sergeants positioned were filled by survivors of Taladorn, two by sergeants from the 7th Company, and one by the respected Sergeant Odin, a 1st Company veteran. With the appointments determined, the replenishment draft began. Many of the 3rd Company's new warriors, some 60 battle brothers in all, came from the reserve companies. Captain Jonas's 7th Company, which had itself recently returned from a campaign amongst the Ghoul Stars, contributed almost 40 tactical marines, which, at Lysander's instruction, were divided among the battle-worn squads. Thus, no unit would be manned entirely by the less experienced warriors of the reserve companies. The remaining inductees were scouts that Lysander personally selected from the 10th Company. He took only the most promising recruits, those that the irascible Captain Monteith considered ready to make the transition to full battle brother. These, like the inductees from the reserves, were spread throughout the company. As soon as the Storm of Wrath was underway, Lysander set aside all but the most vital of his captain's duties and assumed the role of the drill sergeant he had once been. At the best estimates of the battle barge's navigators, it would take 15 days for the vessel to reach its destination, and Lysander 
intended to put every moment of that time to good use. A portion of one of the battle barge's decks was given over to a firing range, and Lysander now pressed it into almost constant service. The walls of this chamber were lined with the same adamantium plating as the storm of Raff's outer hull. Nothing short of a macro cannon shell could have dented it, and the bolt gun volleys that now roared across the gloomy chamber did little more than scratch it. Lysander worked ceaselessly, instilling into the Third Company's warriors the same lessons that Sergeant Mackin had once drummed into him. Imperial Fist doctrine had long ordained twenty separate observances for the ritual of firing a bolt gun, and a further six for the replacement of a spent magazine. Most were little things, silent litanies that the Battle Brothers quickly learned to perform out of habit. Individually, they took little toll of time and concentration, but together they dulled reaction time and accuracy by a slender but noticeable margin. Squad by squad, Lysander announced the nullification of a full fifteen of these observances and decreed substantial modifications to free others. He then drilled his battle brothers ceaselessly until this new litany settled into their minds as firmly and instinctively as the old. Lysander pursued this course with forthright passion, sleeping little and brooking no question to his orders. It was plain to Garadon that his captain was a driven man, but he could not divine whether that drive stemmed from a need to atone for the harm he had wrought upon the third, or from a desire to be unshackled from the company and return to command of the first. Whatever the reason, Garadon could not argue with the results. A week into the journey, reaction time and bulk gun accuracy had markedly increased. As a result, when Chaplain Markov made angry complaints to the sergeant about Lysander's breach of tradition, Garadon found himself giving his captain full support, a standpoint that surprised him almost as much as it did the chaplain. By the time the Storm of Wrath emerged from the war, the Third Company was as fine a weapon of war as Lysander could make of it in the time available. Now it was the time for that weapon to be tempered in battle. According to the Imperial Fist's records, the Magor Rift comprised two planetary systems in close proximity to a vast belt of debris. The remains, or so, Scholars had hypothesized of a third system. A fourth system, Vaishan, was thought to lie further to the galactic east, but warp storms had severed it from the rest of the Imperium for more than forty years. Of the two systems that remained, the Jindara system was believed to be totally bereft of life, whereas the Kalin system was home to an Imperial agri world. Indeed, the lush agri domes of Kalin too had for many years provided food, not only for its neighbours, but also for several nearby hive worlds. By all accounts, it had been a rare paradise in a galaxy too often beset by terrors, a latter-day parallel to the Eden of ancient myth. Alas, it was paradise no more. The Storm of Wrath and its support fleet re-emerged into real space in close proximity to Kalen II, and in the midst of a starscape clogged with drifting wreckage. Though no one aboard the battle barge yet knew it, the astropathic distress hymnal that had reached the Imperial Fists had been waylaid in the currents of the war. Thus, a conflict Vladimir Pew had considered to be in its early stages had in fact raged for many months. As the Imperial Fists arrived, the remnants of the 95th Cadian battle group strove against a green-skinned tide on the planet's surface. The surviving vessels of the Imperial Navy, dispatched from the shipyards at Nemea, fought to blockade the near-constant flood of orc cruisers that warped in system from an unknown base. This was not a war, not yet, but if it were allowed to gain momentum, it could yet threaten sectors further afield. As the storm of Raf's captain guided the battle barge skillfully through the debris field, Lysander made contact with the general of the Cadian army, or rather, he tried to. Gathering reports from several junior officers, Lysander learned that the defence of Kalin II was all but over, and the 95th battle group as good as destroyed. Of some 100,000 Imperial Guardsmen, that's a lot, had deployed to the planet, scarcely 3,000 remained. Most were entrenched around Shavanol, the planetary capital, giving the last of their strength to defend the refugees, who were all that remained of Kalin II's civilian population. The rest of the planet lay in orc hands, with ramshackle, soot-belching factories nestled amongst the remains of the ruined agri-domes, providing a seemingly unending supply of wagons and walkers for the ongoing assault on Chavanel. 
Without further delay, Lysander divided his command into two separate forces, Strike Force Anvil, containing the bulk of the Third Company's tactical squads, as well as its Storm Talons and Battle Tanks, bolstered the defences around Shavanagh against the continuing Greenskin assault. Meanwhile, the remaining warriors would fight as part of Strike Force Hammer and assault the Orc factory complexes, choking off reinforcements. Garadon expected Lysander to take command of this second force, for it was there that the greatest opportunity for glory lay. He was therefore somewhat surprised when the captain gruffly announced that he would instead assume command of Chavanel's defences. Thus, as much of the Third Company put their newly honed bolter drill to use from Chavanel's battered ferrocrete rampart, Garadon led Strike Force Hammer out into the once verdant wasteland. Superficially, no two of the Orc factories were alike, with chimney stacks, mech workshops, and weapons emplacements arranged seemingly at random within the tumbled walls of old agridomes. Yet careful reconnaissance by Garadon's scout squads confirmed this assumption to be inaccurate. Beneath its skin of rusting buildings, the heart of each facility shared a certain commonality, constructed as it was around a sparking reactor, which fed everything from piston-driven gates to the tractor cannon batteries that made orbital bombardment of the factory a suicidal proposition. Though the defences around the reactors were sufficient to prevent simple sabotage by the scouts, the novitiates were able to conceal locator beacons amongst the ramshackle structures, enabling a series of precision drop pod assaults into each factory's vulnerable heart. During the voyage to Kalen, Lysander had not been satisfied with overturning the Third Company's established bolter drill. He had also ordered one of the Thunderhawk gunships retrofitted to accommodate a larger number of Centurions. The artifacers and tech marines aboard the battle barge were scarcely less appalled at the decision than Markov had been by the captain's other changes, but they had complied nonetheless. Now Sergeant Garadon put them to good use. As the rampart of green-skin dead and mangled wreckage around Chavanel grew ever higher, Garadon brought ruin to each of the Orc factories in turn. Each assault began simply enough, with the Storm of Wrath enduring the fury of a factory's tractor cannon batteries just long enough to fire its drop pods at the target. Descending too quickly for the Orc weapons to track, the drop pods slammed into the factory, disgorging Garadon's strike force into the very heart of the complex. There, Garadon's own tactical squad, as well as the strike force's two dreadnoughts, destroyed the anti-air batteries, whilst the company's assault and devastator squads now piloting Centurion warsuits, deployed via Thunderhawk gunship and destroyed the reactors. With the factory's remaining defence batteries silenced by power loss, Thunderhawk gunships launched from the Storm of Wrath were able to extract the strike force before they were overwhelmed. Soon after, the battle barge moved into orbit once more to commence a saturation bombardment, pummeling the factory and the half-finished war engines within to dust. Garadon's audacious assaults were carried out with incredible speed and precision, often with only a matter of minutes between the first drop pod launch and the echoes of bombardment dissipating through the bedrock. Even so, there were casualties. A swarm of Dakar jets scrambled during the assault on the factory complex designated Kalen Epsilon, delaying the Thunderhawk extraction by several minutes. A number of tactical marines and centurions were lost in that assault, although two of the pilots escaped by abandoning their warsuits before being overrun. Two scouts were captured during their reconnaissance of Kalin Zeta, and though Garadon altered his assault plan to allow their rescue, one later died of his wounds. An honoured brother Macon sustained damage that took the storm of Raf's tech marines many days to repair. In the meantime, Lysander's Demi Company had suffered its own losses. Chaplain Markov had lost an eye, though he swung the angel of sacrifice as wickedly as he ever had, and claimed he saw the foe better with one eye than he had with both. The predator, glorious redemption, was irrecoverably scrap, blown apart by a stomper's death cannon. Veteran Sergeant Odin was dead, hacked to pieces while single-handedly holding a breach in Chavanel's outer wall, as were six of his battle brothers, and every warrior who held the line at Lysander's side bore fresh scars as proof of their valour. However, Strike Force Hammer's efforts had a swift and noticeable effect on the Orc war effort. With the Nemian blockade fleet denying reinforcements from off-world and their factories destroyed one by one, the Orc assault on Chavanel slackened. This in turn allowed Lysander to 
assign even more of his own forces to Garadon's command. By the time the last factory, designated Kaelin Kappa, had been destroyed, Garadon's assaults were performed practically at company strength. Uniting once more under Lysander's command, the Sentinels of Terra brought the last remnants of the Orc invasion to battle on the Gancha Plains. The war boss perished beneath Lysander's thunderhammer, and the survivors fled into the hills. Though the Orc threat to Kalin was seemingly ended, Lysander and Garadon knew that the Crusade of Thunder was not yet done. Orc battleships still tested the Nemean blockade. The war would only be done when their origin point was located and destroyed. During the assault on Kalin Row, Garadon's strike force had rescued a handful of human slaves. They had been pressed into service in the workshops, performing tasks too delicate for orcs and too important to be entrusted to unreliable grots. Less than half of the slaves were of Kelanese stock. The others had been brought from the hive world of Vishan. As some of the Kelanese distantly recalled, they had provided supplies to Vishan some 40 years previously, before the warp storm had severed all contact. With the presence of the Vishan slaves on Kalin, none of whom were past their 13th year, that warp storm had clearly ceased, and the third company's next destination was clear, leaving Kalin's fate in the hands of the surviving Imperial Guardsmen and the Nimian blockade fleet, the Storm of Wrath left orbit and set course for Vishan. As the battle barge hurtled through the warp, Lysander took stock of his casualties. At his order, Scout Squad Banner was dissolved, and the composition of the remaining squads reordered. Eight neophytes who had already received the Black Carapace were granted the power armor and roles of fallen battle brothers. Sergeant Banner himself assumed the late Sergeant Odin's command over Squad Secundus. Five of the Centurion warsuits had sustained heavy damage during the factory assaults. Of these, only three could be brought to reliable function, no matter how diligently the Tech Marines performed the rites of repair. So Lysander ordered these suits sealed in the armory until such time as they could be returned to Phalanx. With no information concerning the forces awaiting them at Vishan, Lysander had ordered the Storm of Wrath to re-enter real space beyond the system's edge, past the range of whatever detectors the Orcs might have constructed. This quickly proved to be a prescient choice. No sooner had the battle barge arrived at Vishan than its orspex arrays lit up with green-skinned vessels. A massive hulk hung in orbit around Vishan's innermost planet, and scores of other warships were scattered throughout the system. These ranged in size from cruisers, similar to those that the Imperial Fists had witnessed in action at Kalin, all the way up to slab-sided battleships. Storm Raven recon flights later confirmed that seven of the eight worlds were airless and uninhabitable rocks. Vishan Wan, on the other hand, swarmed with greenskins. Indeed, there were easily enough orcs on its surface to challenge a task force of the Crusades of Thunder's size, Challenge, but not defeat, at least if all other things were equal. Sadly, this was not the case. The orcs had not sat idle during their decades of enforced isolation. After crushing Vishan Wan's defences, they had ransacked the world of its mineral resources, causing such tectonic instability that the hive cities had long ago been consumed by angry seas of lava. However, in as close to geosynchronous orbit as the orcs could achieve, was a space station of vast size. Once the docking port for supply of freighters carrying Vishan's ores to distant manufacturum worlds, it had now blossomed into a star fort bristling with shipyards and docking bays and made planetary assault entirely impossible. Cruisers streamed to and fro between the system's outer edge and the star fort, returning with plunder from distant worlds. Clearly, Kalin was not the only planet to have suffered the predations of Vishan's orcs. As Lysander ordered the Storm of Wrath's fleet into concealment behind the meteor-battered ruin of Vishen 8, Sergeant Garadon saw his own irritation mirrored in the captain's face. Operating alone, the Sentinels of Terror had little chance of driving the Orcs from the Vishan system entirely, but it would take time for another force to assemble, and in that time, the Orc fleet would continue to wreak havoc across the sector. Yet, as Lysander ordered a pistol reared doorsway, uh, to request assistance from the Nimian fleet still in blockade position around Kalin, Garadon had an idea. Some time later, three Cestus assault rams departed the Storm of Wrath's bays under Thunderhawk gunship escort and bore down on a lone orc vessel. It had taken several days and much of Lysander's patience before a suitable ship arrived. From its appearance, the cruiser was built around the hull of a captured Luxor-class freighter. 
and it was Garadon's hope that the vessel's original systems and engines would be intact. However, it was the vessel's comparative isolation that made it a viable target. Approaching the cruiser from behind the sensor shadow cast by Vishan 8's moon, Garadon launched his attack. The assault ram struck the vessel amidship, and Garadon's breaching force charged forth to claim the ship. At the same time, the Thunderhawk escort soared ahead, their sensors reconfigured to jam any distress call sent from the beleaguered cruiser. In the end, such precautions proved unnecessary. The cruiser's captain, overestimating the tenacity of his crew, thought a mere 30 assailants could be easily overwhelmed, but was sorely disappointed. After a short but bloody fight, the cruiser was in Garadon's hands. With the vessel secured, Thunderhawks ferried the rest of the company aboard, along with the Storm of Raf's first officer and enough autonomous servitors to man the ship's helm and engine room. Thus manned, the cruiser headed deeper into the Vishan system. It was a long and tense voyage. Everyone from Lysander down to the rawest scout knew that the cruiser wouldn't last long if the ruse was discovered, at which point the four Thunderhawks now lashed under its docking bays would be their only chance of survival. Nevertheless, fate smiled upon the third company. Between the anarchic and often erratic behaviour of the orc vessels in system and epistolary doorsways drawing upon the mystical power of the bones of Osrock and to cloud the orc's suspicions, the cruiser sailed on unharassed. Only when the third company's purloined vessel made final approach to the Starford's docking spur did discovery seem inevitable, but Garadon had planned for this. At the sergeant's command, Doorsway contacted the Storm of Raff, which had made its own leisurely way in system to the very edge of the estimated orc sensor range. Thus far, the battle barge had gone unnoticed, but that changed as its captain brought the mighty vessel's engine to full power and bore down on the nearest orc battleship. The response was immediate, the comm channels instantly jammed as driven by equal parts enthusiasm and outrage. Dozens of orc vessels came to new headings and moved to intercept the intruder. All at once, the third company's captured cruiser was forgotten amongst the anarchy. At Lysander's command, more power was coaxed into the engines, and the cruiser set on course for the central docking spur. Millions of miles distant, the Storm of Raff, the first stage of its mission completed, broke off from its attack run and drove hard for the outer system. The orcs, unaware that the battle barge had only ever been intended as a lure, gave reckless chase, their vessels increasingly strung out as they fast pulled away from the slow. No one aboard the captured cruiser had any inkling of the Starford's docking procedure, but it had never been uh, Garadon's intention to make such an attempt. Instead, the cruiser tore into the docking spur in the manner of a vast boarding torpedo, its prow shearing through dozens of decks before buckling under the incredible pressure. Hundreds of orcs died in the impact, some crushed by the cruiser, others blasted out into the void by their own atmosphere before pressure doors clanged shut across the ravaged docking spur. Before the cruiser had fully come to rest, the third company blew its external hatches and began their assault. Minutes later, they were through the first pressure door and into the undamaged sections of the docking spur. On the Starford's high-domed command deck, Warlord Gormek initially blamed the collision on the carelessness of the cruiser captain, but his black mood shifted to anticipation as reports of intruders came in from the docking spur. It had been a long time since Gormak's last proper fight. He'd led raids against Humi Worlds, but it'd been over 40 years, long before the warp storm had trapped him on Vishan, since he had last battled a space marine. The warlord dimly remembered that particular fight, deep in the minds of some worthless world, as being one of the best he'd ever had, even if it had cost him one arm and most of an ear. Besides, Gormak decided... It would give his boys the opportunity to test out the weapons looted from his new ally. Bellowing orders, Gormak strode from the command deck and went to seek the intruders. Klaxons blared as the Imperial Fists fought their way through the Starford. Lysander, the Dreadnoughts and the Centurions led the way, a vanguard of nigh-impenetrable armour and blistering firepower that swept early resistance aside with almost no effort. They advanced at a relentless pace, bulk guns and... Laz cannons blazing, trampling wounded orcs as they came. Behind the Centurions came the tactical and scout squads, senses alert as they slew any greenskin left alive by the Centurions' advance. Squads Ortez and Lorimar, both under strength following their assault on the cruiser, 
had remained behind with the vessel's ersatz crew in order to protect the priceless Thunderhawks and prepare them for flight. Every battle brother knew that the advantage of surprise would carry them only so far, that sporadic attempts at defence would soon coalesce into something much more dangerous. Nevertheless, they took heart from the fact that, though they were outnumbered several hundred times over, the confines of the Starfort prevented the Orcs from bringing their numerical advantage to bear. Time and again, the Greenskins came bellowing through the refuse-clogged passageways, only to perish by the score as bulk guns roared and las cannons blazed. Caradon's plan, as endorsed by Lysander, was a simple one. If the Third Company could fight their way to the command deck, they could use the Starfort's own thrusters to set it on a doomed orbit, thus relying on Vishan-1 itself to destroy its despoilers. Once their mission was accomplished, the Imperial Fists would escape by a Thunderhawk gunship and rendezvous with the Storm of Wrath, which was due to turn in system once more. With the Starfort's formidable weaponry disabled and the Orc fleet spread out across the Vishan system, escape would prove difficult, but as Garadon had explained during his briefing to the rest of the company, the Imperial Fists did not waste their time on easy endeavours. Those could be left to the Ultramarines. Ooh. The Space Marines encountered their first real resistance at the junction between the docking spur and the main body of the station. Hundreds of orcs waited in ambush amid the cluttered wreckage of what had once been a shuttle bay. Following Lysander's lead, the Sentinels disdainfully advanced into the storm of shooter fire, trusting to their power armor's fortitude, even as their own weapons culled the foe. Heavier sounds joined the deafening chorus as snaz guns and cannons were brought to bear, but still the Space Marines came on. Yet the Imperial Fists were suffering casualties too, and flashes of yellow armor could be seen amongst the jagged scraps of metal and green skin dead. Brilliant light flared, and white hot energy lanced across the chamber. Worn by some instinct, Garadon dove clear. Brother Koron's reactions were slower, and the beam punched clear through his breastplate, killing him instantly. The orc who had fired the shot perished a heartbeat later, as one of Squad Kord's snipers put a bullet through his forehead. However, other greenskins brought up similar weapons, and for the first time, the Third Company's advance slowed as they were forced to seek cover. Even as Garadon directed his squad's return fire, a part of his brain noted that the energy weapons were like no orc technology he had encountered before. The designs were more efficient than was typical for greenskin manufacture, and although each had undergone a degree of customization by its owner, there was a common design visible beneath the extra sights, grips and barrel extensions. Garadon abandoned his analysis, sighting along the Spartan barrel. The bolt pistol flared, and an orc fell stone dead before its fingers could tighten on the trigger. The gunners were retreating now, driven back by the murderous volleys of bulk gun fire, but the attack was far from over. With an echoing cry of WAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAA
tactical squads and dreadnoughts laid down suppressing fire, Lysander and the Centurions formed up around their tech marine, Brother Karazan. Without breaking step, they formed a marching wall of ceramite that escorted him to an instrument panel almost unrecognisable under its orky improvements. The escort held firm as Karazan worked, ignoring the shells crashing against their armour. Again and again, Gormok roused his lads into a roaring charge across the command deck, only for the assault to disintegrate as Garadon poured fire into their flank. Here and there, more of the strange energy weapons flashed, but no technology could compensate for orcish inaccuracy. Many of the shots went astray, and no orc managed a second. Sergeant Cord snipers reserved their fire only for such targets. Battle raged, and still Brother Karazan was at his work. Bolt guns ran dry, and spare magazines were taken from the dead, so that the living could fight on. Gormark drove floods of grots into the fight, in the hope of making the space marines waste their remaining ammunition, but the maddened wretches were hammered down with fists and gun butts. Death dreads and killer cans were unleashed, but the devastators and centurions calmly targeted each in turn, until it was reduced to smouldering and blackened metal. Nevertheless, the space marines were badly outnumbered. If Karazan didn't complete his work swiftly, they were sure to be overrun. Then the orbital thrusters at last began to fire, their labour sending tremors through the deck. Gormok didn't fully understand what the space marines had done. Nevertheless, he saw the stars beginning to move through the command deck's armour glass dome and realised that his mechanics needed to reverse the changes the invaders had made. That hope faded as he saw Lysander bring his thunder hammer down on the control panel, destroying it utterly. Realising that his star fort was doomed, Gormok roused his boys for one last charge. The war boss's fury drove him on through the hail of Baltifar. Roaring with the joy of slaughter, Gormok tore a centurion apart. But then the fallen battle brother's squad mates drove their siege drills forward, and the war boss was turned to a mangled mess of flesh and bone. With Gormok's fall, the orc's enthusiasm faltered, somewhat, and the sentinels of terror quickly seized the opportunity to withdraw. Already the air was filled with the tortured groaning of metal as a star fort never intended to enter atmosphere began to surrender to gravity's remorseless embrace. The docking spur, its integrity already undermined by the cruiser's impact, sheared off entirely and began its own lazy descent into Vishan's exosphere. Garadon felt a moment of dread. If the docking spur was gone, it was entirely possible that the extraction Thunderhawks had been lost as well, severing his company's escape route. Fortunately, comms traffic quickly confirmed that the attack craft had left the cruiser's hold the moment the star fort began to shift. Minutes later, carefully matching their approach to the star fort's lazy yaw, the pilots had set down in a hangar bay beneath the command deck, and the surviving space marines at last made their escape. A few defence batteries gave half-hearted volleys at the retreating Thunderhawk gunships, but only a few. The vast majority of the Orcs had abandoned their station in search of escape pods or functional ships. Most would fail. As previously arranged, the Storm of Raf's fleet was once more headed in system. Behind it spiralled a trail of wreckage from where several Orc vessels, too eager for a kill, had strayed into weapons range. A score of green-skinned vessels, a mixture of cruisers and battleships, still pursued the battle barge. However, most of the Orc starships were arrayed in battle formation against newcomers on the edge of the Vishan system. The tides of the warp had been kind, and the Nimian fleet had arrived earlier than projected. Though there were not enough Imperial vessels to bring the Orcs to battle, there were too many for the Greenskins to ignore. Now, like a wolf torn between a choice of prey, the Orcs risked losing both. And so it proved. Soon after, the Third Company's Thunderhawks touched down in the Storm of Raf's Ford Bay, after a brief broadside duel with a battle cruiser, the Storm of Wrath entered the warp, the Nimian fleet making a similar withdrawal moments later. Meanwhile, the dark silhouette of the Starfort began to glow red as Vishan One took revenge on its despoilers. By the time the Storm of Wrath had returned to Kalin, Garadon had drawn plans to end the orcs of the Magor Rift for good. With their base of resupply destroyed, the green-skinned starships would be easy prey for the Imperial Navy, and once the fleet was driven off, the Crusader Thunder could retake Vishan from its brutish conquerors. Lysander concurred with the sergeant's appraisal of the situation and ordered the Storm of Wrath to break orbit, 
As it did so, however, a pistol reed doorway received an urgent message from Phalanx. A tyrannid infestation had taken root in the Drashen system. At less than a hundred light years from Terra, this place, the rapacious Xenos, a mere stone's throw from the Imperium's heart. Accordingly, and at Vladimir Pugh's orders, all Imperial Fist strike forces, including the Crusade of Thunder, were summarily recalled to confront this threat. The war against the Orcs would have to wait. Infestation on Drashin When the Storm of Wrath arrived at Drashin, it found a world heaving beneath the mass of tyrannid swarms. The roots of the infestation could be seen even from orbit, millions of dark carapaces blending together to form roving lakes that left nothing but bare rock and wasteland in their wake. At least there were no hive ships in orbit. In fact, no tyrannid bioships of any kind appeared on the battle barges or specs arrays. Only the blocky shape of an Arx Mechanicus, several Imperial Navy transport craft, and other Imperial Fist fleet elements. The Storm of Wrath's sister ship, Spear of Vengeance, amongst them. They hung immobile, beyond Drashin's skies, the guns silent as the battle for survival raged on below. It was not long before Lysander discovered why. Crackling heat storms boiled through Drashin's atmosphere, making comms contact with the planet's side defenders broken and garbled to the point of incomprehensibility. However, ship-to-ship comms were another matter, and the Spear of Vengeance's captain gave Lysander a succinct account of the tactical situation at hand. The crisis of Drashin had begun some weeks earlier, when an unnamed space hulk had materialised out of the warp on a direct heading for the planet. Judging by its crude hull adornments, the vessel had lately been under Orc command. But other than a marked deceleration in its approach, there had been no sign of life aboard as it crashed through the Adeptus Mechanicus picket fleet and collided with Dreshin itself. Much of the space hulk had been destroyed by the Mechanicus ships or else had burned up in the planet's thick atmosphere but enough of it had survived to wreak calamity on the planet below, causing the world to shift slightly on its orbit and throwing up a cloud of particulate matter that had choked away the sun. Drashin's planetary crust was incredibly brittle, and the impact had all but obliterated an entire continent, leaving jagged obsidian platelets scattered across a seething ocean of magma. Worse was to come, as a crust of cooling rock hardened around the Space Hulk's hull. The Tyranid swarms had emerged from rents in the vessel's flanks. The magma oceans around the impact site had provided little in the way of biomass, uh, but the jungles further to the west had provided a more tempting target. Before help could arrive, a swarm already glutted on the Space Hulk's previous occupants had blossomed to many times its original size. Under the circumstances, orbital bombardment or even exterminatus would have been the prudent course. However, the relief force's orders had been explicit. The Tyranid infestation was to be ended with minimal harm to the planet itself. The Spear of Vengeance's captain did not know the reason for the order, only that it had come from Terra itself. It didn't matter, Lysander could guess. There was an Adeptus Mechanicus archaeological outpost on Dreshin's northern pole, and had been since the captain's unintended sojourn in the war. Whatever it was the servants of the Omnisire were looking for, it was clear that they didn't want it accidentally destroyed, even in circumstances as dire as these. The price of such restraint was quickly paid. Even with the arrival of the Katachan 31st, millions of Imperial citizens had perished, with millions more on the brink. By the time the Imperial Fists had arrived, the determined jungle fighters had slowed the Tyranid advance, but only at the cost of a further two cities and many thousands of their own warriors. Now the swarm was deep into Dreshin's largest continent, and the Adeptus Mechanicus's polar base remained secure only through the efforts of Legio Magna's titans and a muster of knights from House Krast. As matters had transpired, Vladimir Pugh's task force, comprising some four companies of Imperial Fists, had arrived only one Dreshin day before the Storm of Wrath. Pugh knew that there had been instances of gene-stealer infestations, aboard Space Hulk since the Sin of Damnation incident nearly 400 years previously. But seldom before had there been any record of a full-fledged Tyranid swarm aboard such a vessel. Pew had taken this to mean that the Space Hulk's mangled skin concealed at least one Norn Queen, though how one of the brood mothers of the Tyranid swarms had come to be aboard the vessel he could not fathom. 
and had elected to lead a strike straight at the infestation's heart. Unwilling to risk a drop pod descent onto the Space Hulk's magma-strewn surrounds, Pew had led an assault via Thunderhawk gunship. Nearly half a day had passed, but no communication had been heard from him since. Brooking no further delay, Lysander vowed to follow in Pew's path to bring aid to his chapter master if he still lived and to avenge him if he did not. Yielding command of the tactical squads to Garadon once more, Lysander led the Centurions and his two dreadnoughts to a Thunderhawk and departed into the atmosphere. The Crusade's Thunderhawks met resistance as soon as they entered Dreshin's upper atmosphere. Winged bio-constructs flew shrieking through the skies, acidic venom spurting from their chitinous weaponry. The spray hissed and sizzled wherever it struck a Thunderhawk, and the pilots were forced into dizzying evasive manoeuvres. Smaller tyrannid beasts swirled around the descending strike craft, their shots barely scratching the hull, but their brittle bones clogged the innards of the turbofan engines. With a shriek of tortured metal, Garadon's Thunderhawk plunged from the sky, avoiding collision with the ground below only through its pilot's deft skill. Undercarriage screaming and buckling, the front half of the craft slewed to a halt on one of the larger platelets. Its stern was not so fortunate, and was already threatening to sink into the magma, taking its precious cargo with it. Once again, the Thunderhawk's pilot proved his worth, coaxing enough life out of the craft's failing thrusters to hold the flyer stable while its passengers disembarked into the spore-choked air. By the time the thrusters finally gave out, the transport bay was empty. Only the pilot perished, as the Thunderhawk slipped beneath the surface of the burning sea, his life a price willingly given, so that his battle brothers could fight on. Garadon's Demi Company had avoided death thus far, but it still waited to claim them. The rocky islands were swarming with tyranids, and the nearest creatures broke off to engage them, effortlessly leaping the magma channels that lay in their path. Bulk guns roared, and the first wave of gaunts was blasted to Ikor spattered bone, but Garadon knew the volley had brought only a little time. He could see larger bio-beasts moving in his direction, and he knew that to stand his ground was to be overwhelmed. Just then, a thermal current briefly parted the spore clouds, and the sergeant caught sight of the 7th and 9th Company banners, standing proud on a nearby summit. Pausing only to slam another magazine home into his bolt pistol, Garadon ordered the advance. Meanwhile, on what the 7th Company's chaplain had wryly referred to as Bleak Ridge, before a strangler beast had torn him apart, Captain Jonas had resolved to die with pride. Before him lay the wreckage of three Thunderhawk gunships. Behind him, the Space Hulk's flank towered into the sky. Hours earlier, Pew had led the 1st and 5th Companies through a rent in the Adamantium Leviathan's hide, ordering Captain Jonas and Terrell to hold their battle brothers back to act as rearguard. Initially, the combined firepower of the 7th and 9th had been more than enough to match the Tyranids. But an hour previously, the swarm had grown in size and flown into a desperate frenzy. Jonas didn't care why. He knew only that he would keep firing until his magazine ran dry and would then tear the beasts apart with his bare hands until strength finally left him. Captain Tyrrell could do little of either, for he had been blinded by a spray of acid but still he took pride in his battle brother's efforts as he bellowed encouragement. It mattered not that they were reserve companies. That day, they fought with vigour fit to shame the veterans of a hundred younger chapters. Another wave of termagants massed beneath Bleak Ridge, and Jonas prepared a sally to clear the slopes, as he had done a dozen times since taking up position. Tyranid warriors and carnifexes were advancing in the middle distance, and he wanted the chaff cleared away before they reached his line. The captain raised his power sword high, but before he could give the order, bulk gun shells hammered out of the spore clouds to the west, and the third company crashed into the swarm of gaunts. Garadon led the charge. Chaplain Markov came close behind, his voice raised in a wrathful litany. Moments later, three banners stood proud atop Bleak Ridge, and the next Tyranid attack wave fared no better than those that had come before it. Taking a position amongst the Seventh's battle of depleted squads, The third sent salvo after salvo into the advancing Tyranid warriors, leaving the heavier weapons of the Ninth's Devastators to focus their fire on the monsters beyond. Yet still the Tyranids came, hurling themselves at Bleak Ridge. Again and again Volters roared. The air whistled to the shrill reports of plasma guns and missile launchers. But still the swarm crashed against the Imperial Fist line. Tyrannofexes stomped forward, 
their sprays of flesh borer beetles rattling against power armor before las cannons brought them down. Spore mines exploded upon the ridge, killing or injuring space marines in ones or twos. Terrell was still at the rear, bellowing encouragement at his brothers, all the while ignoring the searing pain from his ravaged eyes. Jonas was still issuing orders, his voice brittle with his hatred for the creatures that mustered below. Increasingly, though, those imperial fists who fought on the heights now listened for Garadon's calm voice as he directed the defender's fire with an efficiency learned over thirty years of service and honed under Lysander's tutelage. Then, a bio-titan emerged out of the swirling spores and Garadon knew that the ridge was lost. He was about to order his brothers to withdraw inside the Space Hulk when an ear-splitting boom sounded overhead. Lysander's Thunderhawk had fared better than Garadon's during the descent, but not by any great margin. A glancing collision with a Haradon had sent the flyer spiralling out of control and away from the battle. In the end, it had made a jarring touchdown some 80 miles from Garadon's position, and Lysander had watched with growing and impotent rage as Brother Karazan struggled to restore the wounded gunship to full function. The skies above had been kept relatively clear by the storm talons of the Sword of Pollux, who had shredded any winged bio-beast that strayed too close. Now, after a fraught delay, Lysander's Thunderhawk joined the battle for Bleak Ridge. A barrage of fire from the Thunderhawk's turbo-lasers and Hellstrike missiles tore great holes in the bio-titan. The Hierophant gave a thunderous roar and brought its bio-cannon about to target the newcomer. It stumbled forward as a volley of las cannon fire from Bleak Ridge sheared off one of its forelegs. Before the beast could recover, a second shot from the Thunderhawk's turbo laser tore its skull to ruin and it toppled over into a pool of lava. Coming in low, Lysander's gunship swept across the battlefield, its heavy bolters tracking synapse nodes and drowning them in heavy caliber shells. At once, the Tyranid swarm shuddered as the feedback rolled through the hive mind. As the attackers recoiled, the Thunderhawk touched down on Bleak Ridge and Lysander let the Centurions out into the battle. After receiving reports from Garadon and Jonas, Lysander ordered his two dreadnoughts to join the defense of the ridge, then led the Centurions into the Space Hulk's bowels. Lysander soon lost track of time during his journey through the Space Hulk's corroded and pitted corridors. The captain could have been traveling for hours or days or weeks. He never knew nor cared. All that mattered to Lysander was that his old company and his chapter master were somewhere in the darkness ahead. He still couldn't make comms contact with Pew or any member of the First Company, though his sensors registered several other suits of Terminator armor several miles in the distance. Lysander made no account of the creatures he slew within the Space Hulk's tangled passageways. Gargoyles screeched out of the darkness, wings flailing madly. Gene stealers dropped from ceilings or emerged from crawl spaces, talons lashing out at the intruders. All the attackers perished, pulverized under the crushing impact of the Fist of Dawn or else blown apart by a centurion's salvo. After a close-fought battle in which a crackling trigon claimed two centurions' lives, Lysander's strike force found a working conveyor which carried them deep into the vessel at phenomenal speed. When they stepped off the conveyor, they found the walls subsumed by pulsating organic matter that spat acid and lashed at them with vestigial tendrils. Torn scraps of flesh marred the corridors, the remains of sphincter portals shredded by First Company chain fists. The carapaces of tiny bioforms crunched underfoot at every step, and seething fluid dribbled down the waxy walls to collect in folds and hollows. Lysander could hear the sounds of battle echoing through the corridors now, and the sensor outlines of his fellow Terminators were solid, where before they had been hazy. At no point did the tide of Tyranids cease, but Lysander was too close to his destination to yield. Smashing through a brood of hive guard, Lysander emerged at last into the chamber where his missing brothers fought on. It was a vast space, larger even than the Grand Basilica on Terra in which the Pillar of Bones stood. It was not a chamber aboard one of the vessels that made up the Space Hulk, but an empty hollow between two such ships, sealed tight by some incredible unknown pressure. Rivulets of lava trickled down the walls from high above reminding Lysander of how deep into the ship they had come. Before him, the First and Fifth Companies fought amidst a roiling sea of Tyranids. Their determination was sufficient to keep them from drowning beneath the screeching tide, but it was clear they could make no headway. 
Here and there, Lysander could see armoured bodies amidst the carnage. Too many battle brothers had fallen, and the goal was not yet accomplished. Sporadically, storm bolters sounded, but most weapons were spent. Their wielders reduced to fighting with fists or combat blades. And yet their target was so close. There, in the chamber's very centre, suspended from a web of muscle and chitin, was the grotesque abomination that was the Norn Queen. As Lysander's strike force began carving their own path through the swarm, the captain saw Pew make another attempt to advance. A hive tyrant moved to block the chapter master's path, and he was hurled back in a spray of blood. But Pew was not so easily thwarted. Rising to his feet, Pew came forward again, the hand of judgment crackling as energy fields played around it. The monster's leg collapsed under Pew's first punch, its torso under the second. High above the battle, a fresh brood of gene stealers burst forth from the Norn Queen's birthing pouches to scuttle down the walls. Three Terminators forced their way forward, thunder hammers crackling as they swept the packed waves of Gaunt's aside. A carnifex slammed into them, the impact sending two staggering backwards as his claws sliced through the third's armour. But the intervention had brought Pew time. Gathering the Hand of Judgment into a fist, the chapter master stepped over the hive tyrant's corpse and punched forward, buckling the chitinous plates that crowned the carnifex's head and ravaging an eye cluster. As the beast reared back in pain, several centurions found their mark. Laz cannons blazed, burning a blackened hole through the carnifex's torso. However, even as the beast collapsed in its death throes, its mace-shaped tail scattered Pew's bodyguard and knocked the chapter master from his feet. The gene stealers were on Pew in a heartbeat, claws tearing at the ceramite of his armour. Other members of the first company surged forward, acting Captain Julan amongst them. But Julan was snatched to oblivion by a trigon's flailing claw, and more gene stealers pressed forward to prevent the survivor's advance. Pew lashed out again, and again, as he tried to regain his feet, but the foe were too many. The Hand of Judgment crackled furiously one last time, then the chapter master vanished beneath the betaloned tide and was torn limb from limb. With a great cry of rage and loss, Lysander forged forward through the swarm, driving the gene stealers back from his slain chapter master. With him came the centurions and the survivors of the first and fifth companies, their limbs finding fresh strength as they vented their fury at Pew's death. Yet, though they reclaimed the bloody ground upon which his dismembered corpse lay, they could advance no further. High above, more birthing pouches split open, disgorging ever more and ever larger bio-constructs into the fight. Laz cannons were now turned on the Norn Queen, but the shots glanced off her carapace. A chain fist could have done the job, perhaps, or a thunder hammer, but with the target suspended so high, it was impossible to bring the weapons to bear. It seemed that the Imperial Fists would have to retreat or be overwhelmed, but neither Lysander nor Hagen were prepared to trade the lives of their fallen battle brothers for so ignominious a defeat. Yet little by little, amidst the horror and fury of that cavern, Lysander realised that the situation was far too similar to Taladorn for his liking. Once again he was surrounded and outnumbered. If he didn't order the retreat, more lives would be lost. Pew had been correct, the captain realised. Unthinking stubbornness served no one save the Imperium's foes. Yet still Lysander could not bring himself to fall back from the fray, and, as battle raged around him, he sought an alternative. The captain's eyes tracked around the chamber, coming to rest on where lava trickled in from above. For a moment, he stared blankly, knowing he had hit upon the solution, but did not yet know what it was. Then, as realization dawned, he ordered the Centurions to ignore the Tyranids and concentrate their fire on the dully glowing trail of magma. Laz cannons fired as one, but to no effect. Twice, three times, more they fired, but still nothing. Then, on the fourth volley, the ceiling buckled and a viscous stream of magma dribbled down onto the Tyranid swarm below. Still the Centurions fired. The breach widened, and the stream became a flood. The Norn Queen hissed and shrieked as a searing rock splashed against her carapace and began to eat through. But she could not break through of her fleshy web. Magma was beginning to pool in the chamber's heart, 
and the Imperial Fists at last, falling back, dragging their dead with them and retreating to the higher levels where Lysander had entered the chamber. With a terrible crash, a span of the ceiling gave way and the Norn Queen plunged into the spreading lava pool. She was already dying, her innards incinerated by the molten rock, but she fought for life nonetheless, her limbs thrashing madly amongst the magma until finally her body sank beneath the surface. As the Norn Queen perished, so too did every synapse creature from hundreds of miles, killed by the shared agony of their brood mother's death. On Bleak Ridge, some broods scurried for cover as their instincts took over. Others hurled themselves forward in a feeding frenzy. All perished. If not at that moment, then in the following days, when the rest of the Imperial Fists arrived at Dreshen, and a thorough scourging of the world began. Far away, the Tyranids assailing Dreshen's remaining cities rode out the agony of the Norn Queen's death, but the swarm withdrew, all the same, vanishing deep into the jungles and caves to bedevil the planet for a long time to come. Though it had cost the Imperial Fists greatly, Dreshen had been saved. Vengeance Gathers and Several days after the Norn Queen's death, the remainder of the Imperial Fists arrived from the war, in a war against the Orcs of Antagon, a campaign dubbed the Crusade of Steel, they had responded immediately to Pew's summons, but had found their fleet harried by Eldar vessels, launched from Craftworld Sam Han. Faced with the choice of abandoning a portion of his strength to the raiders, nor delaying his arrival at Dreshen, the Second Company's captain, Helion, had chosen to follow protocol and vanquish the immediate threat first. Had it not been for the interference of the Eldar, the Imperial Fists would have stood united at Dreshen, and there was not a battle brother in the newly arrived fleet who did not blame the Eldar for their chapter master's death. Unable to vent their wrath against those deemed most deserving of it, the Imperial Fists threw themselves into the purging of the surviving Tyranids from Dreshen's surface, moving with such implacable vigour that little of the work was left for the hard-bitten veterans of the Catachan 31st. Through it all, the Adeptus Mechanicus offered little assistance, although three knights of House Crast did go against their orders and take the field at the Space Marine's side on several occasions. As the purging of Dreshen continued, more sombre duties were performed. Pew's body was sent back to Phalanx so that his bones might be prepared as a relic for the ages to come. Some thought Lysander the perfect successor, considering that his errors on Taladorn had been washed away by his deeds since. Yet Lysander refused the honour, knowing that he had not yet learned the lessons of his recent past, could not take the chapter master's seat until he had done so. Instead, he reclaimed the captaincy of the first company, which was now leadership again following acting Captain Julan's death at Pew's side. The decision was therefore deferred until the business of Dreshen could be concluded. However, Garadon's rise to the captaincy of the third company was immediate. Pew was not the only brother who fell to the Tyranids, but here the Imperial Fists had been fortunate. Dawn's legacy of blood and bone ensured that for every four warriors who had fallen, only one had perished. The others, coaxed back from oblivion's brink by the apothecary's skill, would yet live to serve their chapter. Some would do so only with the aid of bionic implants. Others, Captain Terrell amongst them, would be forced by their injuries to take up other duties on Phalanx, rather than continue as battle brothers. Nevertheless, of some 100 or so space marines who had fallen on Bleak Ridge or within the Space Hulk, near 70 would fight again. As the unblooded companies spread out across Dreshen in search of tyrannid infestation, Captain Garadon oversaw the investigation of the Space Hulk's half-sunken remains. Working in concert with the Polar Base's engine seers, tech marines dug their way through the vessel, looking for some clue as to what had brought the vessel to Dreshen originally. At first, it was assumed that the Tyranids had merely infested the Space Hulk, but this was quickly discovered to be untrue. The site where Pew had fallen was not an infested star vessel, but a mangled hive ship, concealed by the asteroids and spacecraft compacted around it. Clearly, the creatures had broken free during transit and slaughtered the Hulk's crew, who, in a development too unlikely to be coincidence, bore the same glyphs as the orcs of the Magor Rift. But who had captured the Tyranids in the first place, and why? The coloration of the beasts matched no configuration yet observed by Imperial forces, which was worrying enough. 
the High Fleet codenamed Behemoth had more or less run its course some decades earlier, and the thought that there were other Tyranid fleets converging on the galaxy was a worrying one. After days of careful investigation, the searchers discovered the emaciated remains of a navigator. He was imprisoned within the Space Hulk's drive units by a many-tendrilled cyber cradle, and protected by a force field that withstood all attempts to breach it for more than a week. When the force field was finally dissolved, the navigator died at once, killed by some suicide mechanism within the cradle. Further investigation of the navigator's cybernetic interfaces revealed that Dreshin had not been the Space Hulk's intended destination. The original course had been set for terror, and it seemed likely that the navigator had been able to resist his implants just enough to throw the vessel from its intended heading. Though bound, body and mind, still, he had found a way to serve his emperor. Garadon was sure the defences around the Sol system would have prevented the Space Hulk doing to Terra what it had done to Dreshin, but that did not diminish the plan's audacity. With the Navigator's death, it seemed that no one would ever know the architect of Dreshin's woes. However, as the wreck of the Space Hulk was broken apart for salvage, a brass naming plaque was found emblazoned on the ancient Heresy-era cruiser embedded at its heart. It read simply, Hydros. The meaning of that name was lost on Garadon and his fellow captains, but not so on Lysander. It was a word he knew all too well. In the ancient legends about which Warsmith Shon II had styled himself, Hydros had been the warlord's spear. When thrown, it had unleashed an all-consuming plague that devoured everything in its path. Lysander only knew of this because it had been one of the legends Shon II had recounted to him during the terrible days on Maladrax, but he knew at once it was no coincidence. If the Tyranid swarm had taken full root on Dreshin, or worse yet, on Terra, a new high fleet might have one day grown in the Imperium's very heart. Upon the chapter's return to Phalanx, Lysander's fellow captains again made the attempt to have him take Pew's place. This time, Lysander gave the matter more careful consideration. The Imperial Fists needed leadership, that much was true, but some instinct gnawed at the first captain's hearts. Unable to resolve the matter through conscious thought, Lysander spent many days silently meditating in the Cloister of Remembrance. On the fifth such day, Haldor Marzen, the chapter's chief librarian and Pew's closest confidant, intruded upon Lysander's gloom-laden solitude. There, the mystic explained that Pew's order for the Crusade of Thunder to strike the orcs of the Magor Rift was not the censure that it had first seemed. During his long years of service, the chapter master had forged many allies throughout the Imperium, and possibly beyond. Since Shon II's escape from the destruction of Maladrax, Pew had used these connections to uncover any information he could concerning Shon II's plans. Though the chapter master had never succeeded in locating Shon II's base of operations, he had uncovered many of the Warsmith's allies and set his chapter to the business of their destruction. The strike in the Magor Rift, Marzon explained, had been the latest in a long line of similar actions. Lysander was unsure how to react to Marzon's words, to the revelation that, under the guise of reprimand, Pew had engineered a manner in which vengeance could unknowingly be pursued. The captain didn't doubt for a moment that the librarian had spoken truly. Within the chapter, Marzon was known for his unflagging and often outspoken honesty. But moreover, his words made sense of recent events. Lysander remembered the weaponry his battle brothers had endured during their assault on the Vishan Starfort. Weaponry that could, well, have been provided by Shon II's warpsmiths. He recalled that the Space Hulk loosed upon Dreshin had borne the same glyphs as those he had seen on Kalin and Vishan. It had to be true. More than ever, Lysander knew he was not ready to take Pew's place. He was too selfish, too single-minded in his pursuits. Were he in command of the chapter, he would have set it solely to the purpose of Shon II's destruction, neglecting the Imperial Fist's broader duties. Thus, when Lysander convened the chapter council, it was to refuse the position of chapter master once again. To the surprise of all there gathered, the captain spared nothing of his pride and explained what he had learned of Pew's actions, and of the flaws within his own character. Lysander announced that he would never serve as chapter master so long as Shon II still lived. So long as the warsmith strode the stars, Lysander knew he could never be certain of his own judgment. 
The chapter council accepted his decision with reserved dismay, but could defer the matter of the chapter master's appointment no longer. After much debate, the rank was finally bestowed upon Vaughan Hagen of the Fifth Company. No sooner had the appointment been made than Captain Garadon stepped forth. The Third Company wished to see their crusade completed, not against the orcs of the Mago Rift, but against he who had been revealed as their paymaster, Warsmith Shantu. Shantu had cast his spear, Garadon announced, but it had flown awry. It was now time for vengeance to find him. Techmarine Karazan had recovered fragments of nav data from the Hydrosis systems, and thus discovered the Space Hawk's point of origin was Maladrax. The Warsmith had returned to his lair. Garadon spoke forcefully and eloquently, reminding all that so many of the Imperial Fist's recent woes could be laid at Shon Tu's feet. The Pew's blood lay as heavily on the Warsmith's hands as it did on the talons of the Tyranids. As Garadon spoke, he saw Lysander nod approvingly, and that affirmation made him doubt his cause. He had learnt much from the first captain in recent months, but had he also been captured by Lysander's blind obsession? It seemed that Hagen believed so, for he denied Garadon's request. He would not, Hagen said calmly, allow his inaugural act to bring about the ruin of his third company. Lysander muttered darkly at this response. Garadon, acutely aware of his recent elevation to captain's rank, remained silent. However, Hagen's next order surprised them both. Turning to Lysander, he bade the captain make phalanx ready for departure. Pew would be avenged, Shantu would be humbled, and the chapter would fight as one. The crusade of thunder would end as it had begun, in battle against one of the Imperial Fist's greatest foes. Yet as the chapter council dissolved and Lysander went to oversee the rituals that would rouse Phalanx from its decades-long dormancy, he realised that Hagen's manner likely hid a need for vengeance that burned at least as strong as Garadon's. Anything could await them at Maladrax, and even Phalanx was not indestructible. Thus Lysander sought out a pistol-reed doorsway. When the first captain had faced Shontu in battle, he had been too proud to request aid. He would not make that mistake again. The Fall of Maladrax Phalanx arrived at Maladrax with the same tortured roar of metal and stone that had marked its every journey for over three thousand years. Those aboard had no inkling that this sound marked Entropy's grasp growing stronger over the mighty vessel. They heard only a war cry sounded by the fortress's machine spirits. No sooner had the ripples of Phalanx's Gellerfields faded away than its scores upon scores of defence lasers, torpedo tubes and macro cannon swung to readiness. Drive engines flared as the escort fleet, the Ultramarine's cruiser Valen's Revenge and Tycho's free Ascalon-class frigates amongst them slipped their stasis moorings and came about. Maladrax lay directly ahead, a burnished orb lit with writhing fire. Clusters of Iron Warrior cruisers and Orc vessels, the survivors of Vishan, hung in its shadow. One craft loomed larger than the rest, hanging over Maladrax like an evil moon of jagged spires and contorted metal. Umbilical pipelines trailed from the vessel's aft, writhing like serpents as they vanished into Maladrax's clouds. It was vast, almost as large as Phalanx, and though he had never seen it before, Lysander knew its name. This was Tarmunash, the ancient war bark built long ago by the warlord Shon Tu he believed himself to have once been. After millennia of searching, the warsmith had found it at last. At Hagen's order, the Space Marine fleet closed on Maladrax, the first salvos of fire thundering across the void. Armor plates buckled under punishing volleys. Ships spiraled away, their engines fitfully misfiring as their crews struggled to regain command of their wounded vessels. Orc ships dove recklessly into the fight, cannons blazing madly until their hulls shattered under reciprocal fire. Yet, it was only when Phalanx came within weapons range of Tarmunash that the battle could truly be said to have begun. In the opening moments of the engagement, the two mighty starships exchanged enough firepower to destroy a planetoid. Shields flared and went dead. Armor crumpled and weapons batteries were unseated. And this was but the first exchange of what promised to be a long and grueling match. As Hagen and his assembled captains watched from Phalanx's command, Sanctorum, they saw a section 
of Tam and Ash's prow splinter apart. Tycho, witnessing the battle from Garadon's side, made satisfied exclamation at this small victory. The Imperial Fists made no sound, but nor did any of them offer reprimand for the Blood Angel's unseemly breach of protocol. As matters transpired, it became obvious that it was but a fleeting victory. Like clawed hands clasping each other, the ravaged plates of Tarmanush's hull wove back together, their motions jerking fitfully in time to the pulsing of the ship's trailing umbilicals. Now the purpose of those conduits were clear. Tarmanush was feasting upon whatever substance the umbilicals carried. They would have to be severed if the vessel they fed was to be destroyed. Hagen swallowed a curse at that realisation. He had hoped to secure Maladrax's orbit before launching Planet Strike. Now it seemed that he would have to enact his plan in reverse. The umbilicals were too small and too distant a target for Phalanx's main weaponry, and no Thunderhawk could have hoped to survive the barrage of fire between the vying star fortresses. Coming to a decision, he crisply ordered his battle brothers to commence a drop pod assault on Maladrax. The umbilical would be severed at their tethering points on the planet's surface. Garadon argued for another course, requesting his chapter master assent to attempt a boarding action of Tarmanash itself. In the same way in which drop pods entered planetary atmosphere too quickly to be tracked by skyfire emplacements, boarding torpedoes would cross the gulf of space between the two vessels. Hagen did not much like Garadon's plan, but the logic was flawless, offering as it did twice the chance of destroying enough umbilicals to render Tarmanash vulnerable. In the end, the chapter master's mind was swayed when both Sicarius and Tycho declared that they would also commit their companies to the boarding action. Only Lysander's first company would remain in reserve, standing ready to teleport strike wherever they were needed. The cluster of Imperial Fist boarding torpedoes struck Tarmanish high on its starboard prow. Thus far, Garadon's gamble had paid off. Not one of the assault craft had been lost in their flight across the void. Though the exit canopies of free had failed to detonate upon breaching the ship's hull, requiring that the occupants cut their way free from inside. Fortunately, Garadon had seen no reason to alter the company's configuration since he had taken command, and the Centurion siege drills made short work of the rebellious hatches. Indeed, Garadon was most grateful for the presence of his warsuits. The confines of the boarding torpedoes decreed that the company's dreadnoughts be reassigned to the planet strike, and the Centurions would do much to compensate for the weakness caused by their absence. However, Comms had been severed as soon as the torpedoes had breached Tarmanish's hull. Worst, Epistle Reed Doorsway reported that the warp was roiling with turbulence, rendering him unable to contact either the other boarding parties or the rest of the strike force. Garadon could clearly recall the accounts of Hadrak Tor, where Shantu had used cultist witches to stir the warp. Clearly the same trick was at play here. The counterattack came at once. The access ways and corridors were tangled thick, not just with iron warriors, but with orcs as well. But numbers were on the Imperial Fist's side, at least for now. As Chaplain Markov intoned ancient litanies of vengeance, they advanced unflinching, driving greenskins and traitors back through sheer volume of bulk gun fire. However, as they fought deeper into the ship, past the endless banks of bond slaves fused into the walls and through the blasphemous shrines, panels slid back in the chamber walls. In their place, automated weapons jutted forward, their sights glowing red with fire, their barrels mimicking the snarling visages of demons. These larger chambers were a mixed blessing. True, they gave Garadon's battle brothers room to fight in one another's defence and create overlapping channels of fire which drove their enemies into bloody retreat, but they also allowed Shon too to bring the Sons of the Forge more formidable weapons to bear. Deck plates buckled as hell brutes thundered forward, weapons blazing and voices raised in wordless bellows of wrath and agony in equal measure. Morlefiends prowled the shrine halls and intersections, the oily exhaust from their metal nostrils fogging the air as they sought the intruder's scent. That it was Shon too who commanded the vessel seemed beyond all doubt, for with every step Garadon took, his mocking voice echoed from Vox units concealed by Tarmanush's baroque design. The warsmith was effusive in his enjoyment of the situation, betraying no concern for the vassals he sent to their deaths. Instead, he recounted tales from his supposed earlier incarnation. He spoke of the poison feasts, the maze of Duzandor, and more than anything else, an endless roster of military triumphs, often at such volume that even the bark and bray of battle was drowned beneath the tide of 
self-aggrandizement. Through it all, Garadon relied on a pistolry doorsway to guide him. The source of the warped tumult was like a black hole in the librarian's senses. His thoughts could not penetrate it, but he could detect its epicenter. For Garadon, restoring communication was of the greatest priority. Until then, he could not request aid from Lysander's first company, nor learn the fate of his allies, or of Phalanx and its fleet. For all Garadon knew, the battle could already be lost. As the third company fought deeper into the ship, the fewer were the Iron Warriors who confronted them, and the more frequent the automated weapons emplacements became. It was not until the third company breached a vast plunder hold, and were confronted by the largest horde of orcs they had yet encountered, that Garadon understood why. As the orcs surged forwards, the ferocity of their war cry, drowning out Shon Tu's relentless monologue, the automated weapons fire increased markedly. The defences had demonic entities fused within them, Garadon realised, and they fed upon the orcs' rage. The greenskins weren't crew, they were fuel. Their crude psychic might, feeding Tarmanish's weaponry both within and without. Doubtless the orcs didn't realise their situation, having been promised only battle and plunder. It was genius in its way. The chief danger to a vessel the size of Tarmanush would always be from boarding actions like Garadon's. However, with the crew's rage harnessed to the vessel's guns, any shipboard assault would only make Tarmanush more dangerous to its assailants, including Phalanx. That realisation galvanised Garadon into fresh action, driving his battle brothers even harder. He pressed on. After what seemed like an age of fighting their way through corridors, the third company emerged into a chamber dominated by a ridged umbilical cable that burst through the floor and vanished into the ceiling. Far below Garadon, on the main deck and framed by burning forge-fiend wreckage, Erasmus Tycho's company strove with a greenskin horde. Even from that distance, Garadon could see that the Blood Angel's relaxed, almost jocose nature had departed. In its place was a cold fury that had transformed the unmasked half of Tycho's face into a rictus of hate. The captain bore a combi melter, but he used the weapon as a club, as often as not, lost to the dark joy of battle. He was not the only one. The Blood Angels had not met the orcs with feet planted and bolters blazing, as Garadon would have done, but had charged to meet them, striving against chopper and power claw with chainsword, combat blade and fist. As Garadon ordered his battle brothers into position, he saw a black-armoured blood angel tear a furrow through the horde, only to be dragged down and hacked apart. At Garadon's signal, the sentinels of terror began to pour fire down into the melee, a near-continual stream of bolter shells, missiles and plasma that blew the rear ranks of the encroaching horde apart. A large orc at the back of the hangar bellowed at his lads to direct their fire against the imperial fists, but the combination of green-skinned prowess and the uncertainty of firing at so extreme and Angle meant that almost all of the shots went wide. Rockets and shells uh, collided with gantries, but only a handful of Garadon's men were struck, and their trusty power armour saved all but two from lasting harm. The same cannot be said for the orcs. Scores of howling Xenos perished as the third company's shot slammed home, and the rest were thrown into such disorder that they fell back from the Blood Angel's fury. Once the chamber was secured, a collar of melter bombs was placed around the site where the umbilical cord emerged. As the charges were detonated, the cable ruptured. What spilled out of the breach was not fuel, nor indeed a liquid of any kind, but a swirling, ethereal mass that shrieked across the chamber before dispersing. Dawsway hypothesized that Tarmanesh was a demon vessel of incredible size and required harvested souls to perform feats of self-repair they had already witnessed. As he spoke, Tarmanesh gave a small but perceptive shudder, Shantou's speech, which had harangued them almost from the first, lost its mocking tone. Now he began to curse and threaten, his voice raw and angry. It grew only more so when a second tremor rocked the ship a few moments later. Garadon knew that either the Ultramarines had severed another umbilical cable from within Tarmanesh, or his battle brothers had severed one on Maladrax's surface. Before the second set of tremors had fully faded away, a scraping of metal upon metal heralded the arrival of another Iron Warrior's war party. They came from higher up in the chamber, descending through the same gantries that the third company had earlier used. They advanced at a dead run, firing as they came. Mauler fiends charged through the mass, shouldering and trampling traitors in their hurry to reach the fight. 
the thumping pistons in their limbs, propelling the beasts forward with frightening speed. Garadon began to order the third company into position, only to be checked by Tycho, whose rage had subsided with the orc's defeat. The Blood Angel pointed out that whatever was blocking the comms had to be cleared, if there was to be any hope of withdrawal, and that his own librarian had been slain in the previous battle. Reluctantly, acceding to Tycho's logic, Garadon left the Blood Angels to their battle and continued deeper into Tarmanash. The passageways were quieter now, the vessel's defenders drawn off by the twin threats of the Ultramarines and Blood Angels, and only a few patrols barred the Third Company's path, and these were soon overcome. Shon too had fallen fully silent, the battle for Phalanx now taking all of his concentration. Twice more the vessel shook before Garadon reached the chamber containing Shon too's psychic choir, each shudder denoting another umbilical severed. The deck shook noticeably now, proof that Phalanx's barrage was starting to tell. The coral chamber was little more than a dungeon. After a pair of assault centurions had torn their way through a blast door, a stinking oily sludge spilled out into the corridor. Within, Garadon discovered nearly three score psychers arranged in concentric circles around a central console. The psychers were suspended upside down from metal frames, their arms manacled across their chests with heavy chains, their heads invisible beneath close-fitting metal hoods. Clusters of tubes ran from their huds and spines, unknown fluids passing back and forth to a coffin-like construct in the chamber's centre, the seepage from which pulled into the muck about Garadon's knees. Revolted, the captain ordered everything in the chamber burned. Dawsway reported that the warp tumult was slowly fading, but comms cleared almost immediately, and Garadon at last learned the status of the battle. Tamanesh now fought all but alone in a field of debris. Phalanx had taken a pounding, but with nearly a dozen umbilicals now severed, either planet side or from within Tamanesh, the battle between the two vessels was turning in the Imperial Fist's favour. From further starboard, along the flank currently facing away from Phalanx, Sicarius reported that he had captured a docking bay, and his ultramarines were in the process of disabling or destroying that quadrant's weapon systems in order to allow extraction. Hagen, unwilling to unleash the full might of his star fortress, whilst three companies of space marines were within its hull, ordered all boarding parties to withdraw. Garadon had every intention of obeying his chapter master's instructions. However, he could not abide the thought that Shon too might yet escape, for the crusade of thunder could not truly end without the warsmith's death. Thus did the captain order Dawsway to divine Shantou's location. Resistance to Garadon's advance was sporadic. He would later learn that Sicarius, having accurately guessed his fellow captain's intent, had sabotaged most of the conveyors in that quadrant of the vessel, isolating hundreds of defenders in distant sections of the ship. Nevertheless, Garadon knew that there was no chance at all that Shantou did not know of the intruder's approach. Every step to the command deck was marked by gunfire, or the wailing screech as Siege drills cut through blast doors. Then, at last, the Centurions tore down the command deck's doors, and Garadon caught the first sight of his quarry since the Talador and Planet Strike. The command deck shared more in common with the palaces of legend than the austere surrounds of Phalanx. Tapestries hung from the bulkheads, their colours dulled with age, the events they retold long forgotten by all save perhaps Sean too himself. In the centre of the room, set high above the rest of the chamber, so that all would know who ruled the vessel, sat a throne of Baroque iron. About the throne, a forest of jagged spear points thrust out of the deck. Atop each was a severed and sightless head, the remnants of those who had displeased their master. As the third company stormed into the chamber, Shontu rose from the throne. His mechadendrites thrashed like branches in a storm as he descended the stairs and led his personal guard into battle. Shon too fought with the fury of a man denied his destiny, and his sons of the forge showed zealous determination. The battle soon became a brutal melee, where age-old hatred was vented with every strike of blade and fist. Garadon struck down Shon too's personal champion before leaping to attack the warsmith himself. Ducking beneath Shon too's axe swing, Garadon leveled a punch that would have crushed his foe's head had not Shon Tu's mechadendrites snaked about his limbs and held him fast. Wrenching his left arm free, Garadon closed his power fist around the mechadendrites, binding his right, but it was too late. Shon Tu's axe came down, cleaving through the captain's helm and slicing into his skull. Knocked backwards by the impact, 
Garadon realised with disgust that he couldn't beat the warsmith. It was then that Dawsway's mind touched Garadon's, bringing a more welcome message than any the captain had yet heard. The warp tumult had at last receded. As his vision began to blur, Garadon thumbed the activation switch on his teleport homer and collapsed to his knees. As Shantu stepped forward, raising his axe high, he paid no heed to the captain's quiet laughter. The air shimmered as the blade came down to take Garadon's head. Then, before the blow could land, the Fist of Dawn struck the warsmith squarely in the chest, the impact flinging him across the room. Scarcely two squads of Terminators had materialised on the vessel. The rest had already deployed to Maladrax's surface to support the other companies, but Lysander had sensed that fate would be kind to him, that he would have another chance to slay Shon too, and had held some force back in preparation for that moment. Two squads were undoubtedly enough. Assault cannons had begun spooling in the moment before transit, and now the heavy shells tore across the room, tipping the balance. Through dimming eyes, Garadon saw Lysander bear down on Shantou, Thunderhammer sweeping aside the Chosen who rushed to stall him. Shantou fought on, but without hope of victory. In their last battle, Lysander had been weary. He was not so now. Shantou's axe blade shattered beneath the fist's strike. The fragments scattered across the deck. As the warsmith staggered away, the hammer's backswing tore open his chest plate, leaving a mass of ruined armour and shattered bionics in its wake. Lysander closed to deliver the final blow, but the surviving Chosen surged forward, and the indomitable captain was driven back. As Garadon sank into darkness, he saw Shon Tu claw his way to his throne. The warsmith gave one last crowing speech, and then hammered at his control console. At once, Tamanash gave a mighty shudder. Explosions rocked the command deck, and a whole section of the chamber gave way as the decks below collapsed. Shantou's throne toppled into the chasm, taking the warsmith with it. Garadon felt strong arms beneath his own, dragging him away from the mangled precipice. Then the captain's eyes closed at last. When Garadon opened his eyes once again, he was aboard a Thunderhawk, his wounds sealed. Throwing off the medic's assistance, Garadon made his way down the gunship's ramp and out onto one of Phalanx's pressure sealed foredocks. In the distance, he could see the swirling, purple hued vortex that had burst into life amidst Tamanash's drive section. Slowly, inexorably, the vast vessel edged backwards into the rift's embrace, its superstructure ripping as the Immaterium reached out to claim its prize. When the rift closed, half of Tamanash was gone, snatched into the realm beyond real space. The remainder of the vessel was spat out. Torn apart by the fantastic stresses, the debris scattered across Maladrax's orbit. As Phalanx moved into Exterminatus' orbit around Maladrax, Garadon saw Lysander amongst the crowd and caught the other's eye. The first captain gave a brief, class fist salute, then departed in the direction of the command sanctorum. Shon too had been defeated, his orc allies scattered, and Tamanash destroyed. The Crusade of Thunder had ended in glorious victory. And thus ends this entry of the Index Astartes. Thank you all for watching. This was a good one. I like this sort of stuff that GW do, like really in-depth stuff about something that's relatively small within the universe, but it, it gives it scope. You include different characters. You show how the universe is a bit more joined up than it would otherwise appear. Uh, you include characters like Captain Tycho, long-term favourite. I didn't even know it was in this. And uh, Captain Sicarius as well, favourite of mine. Really good stuff and really adds a bit of depth and stuff to the Imperial Fists. It always seem a bit of a bland chapter to me. I like what they've done with them recently to give them character and stuff. It's mostly the heresy stuff that's really done that and then they've built on that with the, the more recent stuff. Uh, obviously, events, uh, if you know the Fall of Cadia arc, story arc and stuff, you know what happens with Phalanx and the Indomitus Crusade and stuff. So it's good. This is a good extra chunk with, um, you know, Garadon as well, obviously. It, it just adds a lot to it. Anyway, more to come. Thank you all for watching. Please do subscribe. If you're not subscribed, hit the bell as well. That helps. And also, please do like the video. And please let me know in the comments what you thought. Those two things at the end there, well, all of them, they make a massive difference to uh, to me and the channel and uh, how things go going forward. It really helps on YouTube, small channel like mine. If you listen to the podcast version, please do whatever a like is there, a star or whatever it is you do on those things. I don't know. 
I don't know. I don't really listen to podcasts anymore. But it's on multiple platforms, so there's a way. Thank you all again, though. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed this good stuff, and uh, I'll be back again soon. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a YouTube member, or alternatively, becoming a patron on Patreon or on Subscribe Star. The links are below. If you would like to do any of those things, I would really appreciate that. It really helps, and you can join this list of honour that's scrolling by now. These names, look at them. Look at you all. A roll of honour. Anyway, I'm going to be like, <laughs> too much talking today. I'm going to go. See you later. Bye-bye.